Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another fantastic uh, Rough Assembly webinar, uh, this time curated by the wonderful Steve Little, who is heading the Beck 2 Post Sound uh, Committee on everyone who works in uh, post sound behalf. Uh, my name is Nia Hughes. I'm an organizing official for the London Production Division of Beck2 um, and also have the immense pleasure of looking after the post production and facilities branch. Um, we are joined this evening by Simon Chase, uh, Rachel Tate, Hello. Callis Shamaris, and Becky Hello. Ponting, um, Hello. and obviously, uh, last but by no means the least, Steve Little, who is the person there in the little beard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm just going to run you through a couple of housekeeping things. You'll notice, uh, this is a message to all the attendees, you'll notice at the bottom that there is a chat function and there's also a Q&A function. If I could please, please, please ask you to keep uh, the chats and any kind of um, any kind of links or anything that you want to share with everyone this evening, please put it in the chat function. And then if you have a question, um, I ask kindly that you write it out clearly um, and put it in the Q&A function where it will be picked up um, after the initial panel discussion. Uh, Bektu is the trade union for crew who work in film, TV, theatre, cinemas, arts and live events um, and we currently have over about 13,000 freelancers in uh, in the division that we all kind of belong to. Uh, if you'd like to join this evening, I know that there's quite a lot of people who are not in the union, uh, you can join for £7.50 uh, a month for the first year and Steve's going to tell you a little bit more about that uh, soon. So, Steve Little, I will pass everything on to you now, if that's okay. Okay, thank you, Nia. Thank you for yeah. everything you're doing. Um, okay, uh, yeah, I've written it down because otherwise I'd forget. Uh, I'm a freelance dialogue and ADR editor. Um, as Nia says, I help run the branch um, of Beck2, which is made up of professionals and the picture and sound departments. So, you've got all the editors, the assistants, trainees, and um, sound editors, mixers and assistants, sound um, editors, and they can either be freelancers or facility employees. Uh, we sort of congregate around our website, which is www.theroughassembly.com. Um, and that's basically it for us. I mean, the Beck2 are doing an amazing job at the minute with uh, all the COVID pushing the sort of right at the coal face, digging away for everyone, um, especially for theatre and all the other freelancers everyone who's fallen through the cracks, they're really trying to push hard for that. So they're doing a fantastic amount of work for us there, lobbying the government. Um, okay, so we've had introductions. Uh, we've got Simon, Becky, Rachel, and Callis. So Rachel, first of all, can I quickly ask you to just explain, because there'll be people in the audience who don't actually know what we do, just give a, a brief overview of what a dialogue editor does. You're, you're muted. Good start. So we take the sound from the set, which uh, is quite limited, I'll go into why, and we make it cinematic, basically. So we... You have to remember how little is picked up on set really out of the finished soundtrack. So you've got usually a mono boom above the actors, but could be off mic, could easily have to stay out of the way of the camera. So it might not get as near as you need it to. On top of that, each actor, the main actors, uh, will have a radio mic usually attached here. But the costumes might mean it has to be elsewhere or it might be buried under a scarf. There's lots of reasons why both those things will have problems. So you have to first pick, in every case, which mic you're gonna go with, and then you have to pick how best to clean each of those up so that the finished product sounds as good as it possibly can and keeps the whole audience engaged in the story. Uh, your basic thing is to take the director's film and make it as um, accessible and beautiful as it can be, as it was supposed to be. And that's it really, that's the basics. Yeah, it's just about getting every word and syllable and line as intelligible as it can be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so every every line stands as good a chance as it can to be understood. Yeah. Well, um, maintaining the integrity of the original 
reading, which may be mumbled, maybe, but that intensity of read may be just what the scene needs. Uh, so you kind of, it's always this balancing act between, okay, we need to clarify it, but we don't want to lose that magic. So that that's, and there's, that's such a subjective thing. And it's, um, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so Simon, uh, take us right to the start. You're just about to start a job. Um, yeah. Just for everyone out there, what do you need to get hold of to be able to make a start on a new project? Who do you talk to? Well, here's the thing. So first off, ideally you'd start with a meeting. You'd, you'd want to go to the picture cutting room. Normally they'll have finished shooting. The director will be there with the editor. Uh, we tend to say picture editor simply because we're all dialogue editors and you need to know who you're talking about. So you say the picture editor, uh, maybe his assistants or her assistants will be there and um, you're going to meet them maybe see the movie, talk about the movie, it'll be in a very rough state, it won't be finished, and uh, it won't, they'll have just had maybe a, a pass on some of these scenes, maybe had a full pass of the movie, but you'll just touch base and, and get to grips with um, what they want out of the movie, what you can offer, just, just that kind of uh, human contact, really important often doesn't at all happen and you just never have that meeting that you really would like to have and you just have to talk possibly by a, an assistant in your department or just directly yourself to the first assistant editor who again you just call first assistant everyone will just say that for the for the duration of the film the first assistant although obviously there's a person who's not director but they're kind of off the film by now and what you need to get from them first is what's called the rushes or the sound rolls. And those are the recordings that the sound recorders made on set. They're all digital files these days and they're multi-track files of, you know, they shout action and, you know, sound, roll sound action. And they laid out the microphones, attached them as Rachel was saying, you've got those recordings. You need to get those, all of them. So you're ready to start. So um, that's probably a drive maybe anywhere from a hundred gigabytes of audio to maybe up to a, a terabyte, maybe, you know, depending on the size of the project. You'll of course need a picture file, which is a quick time, um, which is just, you know, the movie. Uh, they'll cut it up into reels. Again, that's kind of historical. They don't, everything's projected digitally now, but you, we still always work in reels or other I, I do. I don't know if anyone doesn't anymore. Uh, feel free to pipe up if you if you don't if you're working on a movie but they just break it up about 20 minute chunks basically so you'll get seven six eight 20 minute chunks of the movie then uh you'll get the guide tracks and that is a kind of all the dialogue on one track all the effects on one track maybe stereo that would be the dialogue would tend to be mono and all the music on one track for each reel so that's just three audio files now, obviously, that'll just be the rough sound from the editor. Our job is to do the sound for the movie. But those those guide tracks are way more important than that because they're they're kind of like the Bible of what the picture editor th and um, director think the film should sound like. And it's like their template. So every change you make from that, obviously, you've got to make a zillion changes. But every change you make from that is potentially, you know, you're changing their movie. So you're kind of, you're doing it, hopefully doing it for the better. But um, th so those guide tracks, they're there to tell you, you know, this is what we want it to sound like. More complicated than that is what's called the AAF, which is, I didn't have to look this up, but it's the advanced authoring format. Yeah, I knew that. Um, and it's basically a version of all the tracks on the Avid, rather than just compressed to all the dialogue tracks. Hopefully it's laid out well and maybe they've got six tracks of dialogue, eight tracks of their temporary effects, couple of tracks of music, and that and it should play with volume and everything. You know, if you um, bounce that out into dialogue music effects, you should match the guide tracks exactly. But um, it, it's kind of, is the editor's tracks and you can see in far more detail what they've been up to. Um, and the other thing you may get, although they tend to get used less, well, I might go into it in a bit, is an EDL. Now I'm gonna do the most boring screen share in the history of screen shares and show you an EDL. 
um, because for years, I didn't really know what it was. It's, it's an edit decision list, and it's literally just a text document. And I'll, I'll try and share it now if I can. Okay, hopefully you're seeing it. Oh no, hold on, share. There you go, you're seeing it. Here you go, check it out. It's so boring. Um, but that's all it is. And what I don't really, we don't, I don't really use them. Maybe we'll go into, there are programs that use them now, but it's interesting to note that all those things I discussed, you don't need any of them to get started. You could just have this text document. This text document tells you that at that time code on the editor's timeline to that time code on the editor's timeline is something from sound roll 80 at these time codes and it happens to be take 4c take 4 slate 4c take 4 so you could just go through that list and make the whole movie soundtrack just by going okay i'll get that bit of sound put it there that bit of sound put it there of course we don't do that at all anymore but that just shows you how basic it is is just you just put the sound from the set. Now, why do, why do we need to do that? If we've got the AAF, which is a detailed version of the sound as it is, why, why do we need to use the sound rolls? Why can't we just use what they've used in the Abbott? Well, as Rachel was saying earlier, um, the, the first track of the recorded location sound tends to be tends to be the first track, sometimes the last, whatever, but it tends to be the first track is just a mix of all those microphones. So you've maybe got eight tracks. First track is a mix of all the seven below it. And it might be a, the seven might be a boom, a clip, a thing. And so the editor will tend to just use that mix rather than clutter up, the picture editor that is, rather than clutter up his AAF with eight tracks, eight tracks, eight tracks, eight tracks. It's just clumsy. They just use a mix. We then need to expand that out into um, and, and find the legs we want. Um, so that's it on a technical side. The only other thing you um, would, would be really useful to have is a cast list, hopefully with photos, because another thing that happens is uh, directors and editors, they'll just start talking about a person like you know them like the back of your hand. So it's a really good thing early on, get the names of the actors down, get the names of the characters down, and so you know at any moment who they're talking about. Um, and then a script. Uh, so again, you can, you can look on the script for um, uh, you know, what, what, what the scene's meant to be. What, if you don't know what the hell someone's saying because the recording's that bad, go check it in the script and you go, oh my God, that's what they're meant to be saying. And um, I'm gonna be in trouble here. Um, oh, it's another thing you can get is a photocopy of what's called the marked up script which will show you each line of dialogue. It'll kind of show on what takes and slates that line of dialogue was recorded. So if ever you need to go and find other versions of a particular line of dialogue, you don't have to then go, oh, well, how do I know where to look? Yes, it's in this scene, but there's a load of stuff in this scene that's nothing to do with that line of dialogue. Well, I know it was only in slate A, B, C, D, G, and L. So once I've searched those, I'm good. I know I've searched everywhere and I've, I've heard every version of that line of dialogue. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, I think that's kind of it. It's, it. The whole thing is called a turnover. You say, I, I want a turnover from the picture department. And that um, is, is all those things. It's the picture file, the guide tracks, the AAF, the EDL, people do use the EDL rather than the AAF. There's software that can help you use that to get back to the original rushes. I tend not to, but um, there's a great piece of software I was just looking at called Ediload. I don't know if any of you guys use it, but it, it, it does, does a great job of, of, of um, expanding the, the tracks to, the, to all those files. Cool. Thank you, Simon. So, uh, Becky, that's a good point to hand over to you. So, you've got um, the AAF, you've got all the floor sound. What what do you what do you do next? What's next in the process? How do you then split out into all these different mics so then you can make your selections? So what I do is I will have hopefully have spoken to the dialogue mixer and got a template for them because these days, if possible, we try and do it 100% in the box. So what's good is if you get a template from them with all their plugins and all their reverb sends and return and bossing and outputs, 
so that you can work within their template. So you can then go from this point to the final mix without hopefully having to change your track layout. So, yes, so. Becky, when you say dialogue mixer, you don't mean the location sound mixer. You Sorry, mix I mean a re-recording dialogue mixer. Yeah. yeah. Um, so once you've got that template, often that will just be a couple of tracks with an example of the plugins that that mixer wants. You then create your own sort of additional template on top, which for me would be uh, sort of six tracks of boom, six tracks of clip, things like RT, PFX, which are the production effects, um, ADR tracks and crowd tracks. And then once you've got that, I then go to expanded tracks that Simon was talking about, uh, which are the rushes, the multi-tracks, and they will come, they will call, everything is recorded for every microphone. So then I will go through each microphone that's been recorded and drag up always the boom and a clip, if there is one, um, per actor. And ideally try and keep the radio for each actor on that same track for that same scene. So it's very obvious when the we recording mixes mixing, who's coming up on what track. Um, so I list, but I do listen to every track in case the labeling from the production mixer on set has got the wrong metadata in it, which can be very common. And so in conjunction with looking at the tracks visually to see the waveform, what they've written in the metadata and also cross-referencing to the sound sheets where hopefully the sound recorders has given you quite a lot of info on why there might be two booms because the actors are going from one side of the set to the other, so then it's picked up from the other boom. Uh, why a, an actor might have two radio mics on. Again, because they might be doing very heavy head turns uh, or have a very noisy outfit on and they're trying different placings of the radio mics to try and reduce that. And so, yeah, I drag up the microphones and then I use clip gain to get them at the sort of relative volume that I'm going to want them at. Um, because when they record on set, often it's quite low, so they don't hit the headroom, um, hit the buffer. Um, and then I start editing those tracks, where I shall pass on to somebody else. Okay, so, um, I mean, do you uh, start thinking about phase aligning the mics at all at this point? Uh, I think we all possibly do this sort of part of the process differently, like... Um, like I personally now do use boom and clip mic together. Um, before yes, I edit both both tracks always. I mean, unless the boom is so like miles away and and um, try not to swear they're rubbish um, that I know it's not going to be used. But I will still put it on maybe track six of my boom edit tracks and mute it and maybe group it and say useless boom. So that if the re-recording mixer goes, was there not a boom there? And your memory six months on, if you're in a film six months, you're not going to be able to remember. You're immediately like, oh, there was. It's rubbish, but I can play it to you. Um, so I find that it's always so important to keep as organised as possible so that you can always backtrack why what you've laid is the reason that you laid it in that way. Why did you go radios and not booms? Have them there, but muted and labelled, saying very off mic. Or as Steve said, I... If, if the boom is actually not too bad, but quite off, quite, you know, a bit loose, I'd have both the boom and the radio mic playing together, phase aligned with a, I use a plugin called Auto Align Post. Um, <clears throat> I will have those two playing together and then do a relative balance because the boom, even if it is a bit wide, can add some nice sort of natural reverb and richness to, you know, sometimes quite a thin sounding radio mic. Um, so yeah, more and more now, probably like you said, Steve, I'm actually using both mics together. I used to kind of make choices, but I, I actually do have them both running most of the time, unless one of the microphones is dodgy. I noticed someone's asked about the clip gain in the Q&A. Um, what have they? What have you said? Do you reference any meters when you're doing your clip gain adjustments, or do you just use your ears? I do it all by my ears. I have basically the, the setup that, you know, what I'll do is, because we change cutting rooms a lot for different films, is I will then play the final mix of probably my previous film and just make sure that in that new environment is exactly how I remembered being in the final mix. And that will be my baseline rather than meters, because I think meters, depending on the frequency, can reflect quite a different level than what your perceived level is uh, for your ears. So I'm totally by my ears. 
I, I use um, a piece of software called Defaulter, which um, again, just gets you into the right ballpark. Sometimes it gets it way wrong because if you're trying to turn up everything to a certain level, uh, but this is this is just something you can leave run. It takes ages to do it, but does it render? Does it render it back in? No, it does it via the clip gain, and it is a bit of a. Um, oh, okay. I'm going to have a look at that. Strain to do it, and sometimes it wasn't worth doing it. But uh, you know, it sort of causes as many problems as it solves. But I say generally, overall, depending if I've got the time and whatever, I'll use that defaulter thing to just get it in the ballpark, so that yeah. when you're making those adjustments you mentioned that you should do and listen to every track and get it all, you're already at a a slightly better starting place. That's, that's a good tip. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, yeah, we're all learning something. What EDL means for a start. Um, <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, Rachel, over to you. Uh, tell me about the actual editing process. What What is involved with that? I mean, the job's changed so much in the last sort of 10 years. Um, we all use a lot of the same plugins. There's some amazing uh, plugins we use, but uh, yeah, talk about... Um, the actual editing process, stripping out PFX for the M&E and all that sort of thing. Yeah, that's, a, weirdly, it's until you do it, you don't realise it's such a big part of what we do is the m &E. We have to make the uh, mm. tracks we work on um, as available to non-English versions of the film as possible. So in between, say, someone's walking into a room and they say one, one line in the middle of it, we will keep all the movement and feet either side and fill where that guy's talked with uh, continuing the rhythm of his feet so that if you take out all the English language which we do when we're prepping to give it to someone to make a German mix or a French mix we want to give them the whole film as complete as it can be minus just that bit of English language so we have to be thinking when PFX come up uh, in the track lay to keep as much as we can on separate PFX tracks um, because uh, it, it's just so important and also the director is very used to hearing it. Yeah, so production effects um, is yeah. what, what we call PFX. That's just anything recorded on set. As yeah. Rachel said, I mean, this could be breaths even. We often put the actors breathing in as an option. Um, and for the m &E, that's music and effects, which is basically the whole film just minus the language. So you can keep the reactions, keep everything except the English words, which gets complicated when you've got a big crowd scene, say, and you're like, can you hear he's just said hello or not? Uh, so it, it's quite hard to pick out what actually is discernible as English language. Um, but yeah, that's a big part of our job, isn't just stripping and making a, a scene just play without the words. Um, yeah. But keeping as much as physically possible. Yeah. Um, uh, but as far as plugins go, uh, once we've got to the stage, where Becky just left it and we picked the mics and we decided what combo we want to play them in. We have to start trying to make them sound as good as we can. So um, a plugin I love to use is um, uh, Isotope RX7 Advanced. Uh, RX8 is coming out soon, but I'm on that one at the moment. And it's great because it's got so many different options in it. You've got Dialogue Denoise, which will pull the noise. It's very cleverly pulls the noise around the dialogue down but retains a lot of the quality of the dialogue, or you've got de-click, uh, de-clip, uh, de-hiss, uh, you know, there's so many different- I've just got a screen share. Yeah, um, go on. Isotope, um, there it is, I've, I've just sent some tone through it. Um, so I, I hope you can all see it, but these are the different tools Rachel was just talking about. Um, I mean, it, it's sort of reasonably expensive for a new start at the industry, but once you get to a certain level, we just all have it. It's just... It's like, transformed our job. I mean, is. in the old days, if there was mic bumps, say, on a on piece of audio, you would have to go and look at alternative takes and try and replace, like, bangs and bumps. And with this particular spectral repair, which is one of the... Um, section of one of the tools on um, Isotope, you can actually draw these noises out a bit like you know, photoshopping but with sound and um, yeah. it's completely transformed. I mean I've been doing this for a very long time now and it's transformed how I work and you know reduced ADR massively and uh, looking for alternatives hugely in the last 
probably what is it 10 years i don't know, I don't know. It, it's probably been around for 10 years but the last sort of i'd say the last sort of five years it's really accelerated oh, in the yeah it's i think it's one of the most amazing bits of kit as a dialogue like spectral repair yeah. You, can, you can sort of see camera whistles or hums and, and lighting winds and just all these different tones and it would literally look like that line of, I put across a tone. Uh, um, so you put some dialogue in it, Steve? I've got, <laughs> I've got no media. It doesn't really speak very much as a blank bit but, of uh, black. But, yeah, I know, I have got <laughs> Shut up, I'm ill prepared. Uh, but you can basically just highlight the section like that if it's um, a constant tone and it just samples from around it and kind of deletes that and just sort of smooths over the gaps. Um, or like Becky said, if there's a low end thump, you just circle around it, it'll come up as a bright light. Um, and it just. I mean, the, the DSing in that same way that you did, yeah. um, it'll come up uh -huh. as a very sort of dense, depends on which spectrograph you have, but a very yeah. dense color, like orange yeah. or I have it set on pinks and stuff. Um, and then you can just sort of reduce its intensity. So you can get like DSing, which would never have been done like that. No. It's quite a good way just to reduce any really sharp sounds. And I, I often have a lovely game of nasal whistles, like especially with old men, you can um, sort of grab it and it's just like, it's always two lines because they play a little tune with a different nostril. Yeah. <laughs> different notes, and you just see it go up and down and then wiggle down and you, you just draw around the, the nasal whistle and it just goes. It's amazing. Here's a question, guys, for you all. How, how, I mean, obviously, when you um, process the sound like that, you're straying from the original. And the more you process, the more artifacts. I think we've all been implying that you can do it as invisibly as 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 we can imagine it was a, a, a lot of previous tools they really had a, a an artifacty sound to them yeah. you didn't really notice when it was processed and and, and a lot of re-recording mixes would be like oh you've processed that too much or this you know I, I i just want can i just have the original sound please i don't want any processing how has that changed for you all are you getting um re-recording mixes grateful happy for you to do everything trusting you that you've done the right things i mean how, how i how always have the original literally just sort of underneath and again i'm, I'm a big one for grouping and labeling so yeah. it will say you know who i mean it simon's dialogue untreated and yeah. then i sometimes might have even variables of the treatment yeah. because in the cutter room i might have pushed it right to the point before i can hear the artifacts and then i might have gone down a bit because i'm a bit like well i think that's a bit too much but again as we all know, it totally depends what it's playing against. So yes. that's when it's great to have the effects bounces and stuff so you can hear. But I would always, personally, I mean, people work differently, but I would always play to the mixer what I've done. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm quite upfront about it because the last thing you want in a final mix is for them suddenly this kind of thing to paranoid. blow up. Like, so, yeah, I'm paranoid. Some, sometimes it can be like, okay, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. He's over-processed everything. Mm. Before we even talk about it, back back to originals. You're like, wait, wait, yes. wait, wait. I just yeah, 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 yeah. that one line. Yeah. You know, there's a load. I of went stuff too far. That, yeah. yeah. There's a load I of would... stuff that we don't want to throw away just because I made a mistake here. So you, you do have that is a sort of political thing you have to mm. navigate well. But also, I mean, obviously, I mean, you know, there's certain mixes we we recorded mixes we work with a lot who know our yes. sort of levels of what we do and how far we push it. But I would always advise anybody to go one notch down from pushing it as far as they think it can go. And because you can always go again, you know, in the, in the premix or something with a tiny bit more. But I wouldn't go as far as, I wouldn't get obsessed with it sounding 100% clean because it's going to go against sound effects and, and atmospheres. So just make the dialogue as clean as you think it needs to be to go against what the background is going to be. If you're in a big train station, it's going to be noisy. So Exactly. I mean, uh... You can have a scene in a storm or on, on board a ship or something and there's been massive fans on the set and you can absolutely destroy the original audio, mm -hmm. which is pretty much unusable. And you think that is, there's, you listen to it and you think there's nothing there. You, you've absolutely destroyed it. You put it against the sound effects and you're like, perfect. Job yeah, done. absolutely. So it, it is, it's, um, it just changes with whatever you're playing against. If it's a quiet scene, 
or say if you've got something set in the 1800s and you're quite near a motorway mm. or, a, or a flight path or whatever, then you can't denoise too much because there's nothing to support it. If it's just a kind of uh, a nice, pretty countryside atmosphere with birds and a bit of wind, you can't hide any severe processing. For that, you just end up ADRing it. There's also, no, there's also cedar. Cedar works great on a lot of this stuff if you and treat it to the right amount and uh, and don't go too far with it and then you can get the effects team to fill the center channel with a similar frequency to bed it bed it where it goes up and down and they can really help if you tell them can you give me some shashi crowd movement here because it's it's you know or some cicadas there because that would really cover that up they will do stuff like that or a gust of wind or yeah. a car you know yeah because yeah. i tend i try and make fill tracks for those very situations and put it up the middle I mean as much as the sound effects people are great but just so I absolutely know that will work and even sometimes some clothes rustle going out in and out of those lines to as, as you said it's the, it's the smooth it's the it's the sort of tricking the ear that you think that's what was going on at the time um, and it, it's all about invisibility isn't it like, it is invisibility our, our whole job it is. You should yeah. not notice anything. We basically just try and get it to zero. Never poke our noses above. It's just we cannot be noticed. Everything we do, and we do a phenomenal amount. Like on a film, you could do five or six minutes of footage a day, just de-clicking, uh, getting bumps out, swapping syllables, clarifying things, slowing things down a bit, whatever. So it's it's an incredibly time-consuming thing, but no one should ever, ever notice. Like, mm. should notice your ADR. They should notice any processing or anything like that. Um, the other thing with something like de-clicking, it's not, it's not just a technical, okay, we need to get the clicks out. It, it helps it, the sound wash over you in this invisible way where you're not, you don't think, oh, I'm listening to some dialogue now. You're just hearing the words and you're just engaged with the actors. And so a lot of these things, it sounds like, oh, you're being a bit nerdy and you de-click, but it's, it's all it is is so that it's just you and the actor and there's none of this other stuff that distracts and the mm. tiny little things can just, it just, it doesn't knock you out of the scene as such, but these things aren't binary. It's not like I'm in the scene or I'm not. It's just the little distractions that you just don't need. And so all of that stuff is, is, is for the art rather than some technical, oh, I, I don't want any clicks in this. Thing. But I mean, that's the thing. It, sorry, it is all subliminal. Everything we subliminal. do, we raise like a, a crowd shout a tiny amount and suddenly the audience is going, oh, I do need to listen to that. I don't know I'm listening to it, but so we're telling them what to listen to the whole time. Yeah. And if you say, don't take clicks out, you only hear clicks in the human world when someone's very close to you. And suddenly mm -hmm. if you hear ADR and it's full of mouth clack clicks, it's like their ear is right, their mouth is right beside your ear. So if you don't get rid of those clicks, they're, they're in the wrong place. Like, you shouldn't be able to hear a click if someone's that far away. And they also take you out of the story. I don't want to know that they need a drink of water or that they've got dentures, you know? It's not, it's not I, important. Unless it's a plot thing and someone's yeah. like, yeah. yeah, it's a character yeah. thing. Sometimes you do leave it in. But uh, I was going to say... Man, I remember that film. Yeah, I, um, I worked on a thing and it was an old man. Um, he was like 80-odd. 80, 80 <laughs> um, and he was just a cantankerous, horrible old like nasty bloke and I left loads of that sort of thing in because it was part of him and his personality yeah. and you thought you want to hear all the stuff we all hate the Clacky clap. mouth yeah like but that was part of his personality like it was it was his character nice it's a good point to show uh, a couple of things we tend to have to focus on for denoise I um, think so so Rachel do you want to uh, play your um, first couple of examples. Rachel's got some examples from 1917 she worked on. Um, and it's basically going to show you the original production. If everyone's got headphones, because uh, you'll not be able to hear it properly through a laptop, um, so headphones would be better. I'll give you sort of a little bit of time to go off and find them if you haven't got them. Um, basically, Steve. Yeah. Now, here's just a question. Just while they go and get their headphones, We've got all these things in the, the Q&A and I'll admit to being a technophobe and I don't know whether we should be answering them as we go or whatever. Well, I, mean, I, I think if we, uh, generally, if, if you notice one as we're going, then um, we'll pick up on it, but usually we'll leave it till the end. Got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, so uh, what Rachel's done is put together the original production um, sound. The recordist did an amazing job with like this incredibly complicated set, one of the most complex ever, really. Um, but obviously there's loads of people running around, there's loads of um, equipment everywhere. So she'll play the original sound and then the edited version. So this is her version. And then it runs into the final mix one. Her version, you'll notice the EQ, the denoising. So it's not just edit. It's not just taking <clears throat> clicks and cracks and bumps out. It's um, it's getting rid of noise. So it's proper denoising stuff as well, which you'll have used the CDA DNS1 for, um, as well as some isotope stuff. Uh, okay, so I hope everyone's got their headphones. If you want to just play the first couple of clips there, Rachel. And it's not just a bit of tin, it's got a ribbon on it. <laughs> I hated going home. I hated it. When I knew I couldn't stay. When I knew I had to leave and they might never see me. I hated going home. I hated it. When I knew I couldn't stay. When I knew I had to leave and they might never see me. I hated going home. I hated it. When I knew I couldn't stay. When I knew I had to leave and they might never see me. I mean, who machine guns cows? Buns with extra bullets. Bastards. Clever. If they don't shoot the gal, really do. Still bastards. How long gone track and they are? Why? When you will catch up with them? Yeah. Right. It's a bloody miracle, this right? Yeah, they're probably right around the next corner. Ah, oh, piss off. I mean, who machine guns cows? Huns with extra bullets. Bastards. Clever. They know if they don't shoot the cow, you will eat it. Clever. They know if they don't shoot the cow, you will eat it. Still bastards. Yeah, it's not even our bloody country. How long gone can I are? Why? Worried we'll catch up with them? <laughs> yeah. Why? This bloody miracle is right. Yeah, they're probably right around the next corner. Piss off. No, they're not. Okay. Uh, yes, I think uh, we should mention that there were only two lines of technical ADR in that whole film, Rachel. So, um, bravo for that. Yeah, that was sounds incredible. great. Incredible. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so that, that was, was a lot of use of RX on that. I've got to say, if it was pre RX days, the, the game mm. that would have been. Hard. And uh, I know studios won't like, like us taking all their business away, but uh, <laughs> I think if you can get the original performance, I mean, Sam Mendes is such a, he's from theatre, he's such a story driven director, he chose those takes even if there was artifacting. And if you listen very closely on that first clip on my cleanup stuff, there's a tiny bit, but I'd rather have that because you get a guy in, in jeans, in gold crest, like six, six months afterwards to recreate that. And I'm sure he could have done a good job, but that's the, that's the take he signed off on that he wants in his film. So you do whatever it takes to make it as engaging as you can. I mean, we used to have, our ADR list used to be huge 20 years ago. And, and as you said, if you, as long as you have a good, good sound recorder as well at the time, um, nowadays, technical ADR generally, your list at the beginning of the, you know, of the edit is pretty low, but then it creeps up with additional lines and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, as you said, Rachel, RX and, uh, and Cedar, but RX for me personally has really yeah. changed the game. Yeah. Within that, it's learning how to use it, say, um, you don't just hit dialogue isolate, you'll hit... Yes, you'll every parameter, you, yeah. You can also copy and paste bits of the, that mm. picture around the world. You can copy and paste bits of it and put it in other places and stuff. There's, mm. there's amazing stuff you can do. And luckily with that, the lack of... Um, we're going to go into conforming very soon, but the lack of 
uh, yes yeah that was was highly unusual and it meant that i could get super forensic on it and not just be chasing the cut as we're about yeah. to talk about just um the other, I, I would like to say though, and I'm, sh I'm sure we, we, we all mean it, as we all praise Rx, it's fantastic, but there's also a heck of a lot you can do and should learn to do and get and, and practice doing just with dialogue editing, yeah. right? Yeah, it's like, yeah absolutely. Just find an alt take where the, the S is a little clearer and stitch it on, but you know, make sure you got that right. Do some manual de-clicking where necessary. If there's one just little click, just go grab it and just you know and and what i think a lot of that 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 natural stuff that you can do with just finding little little helpful bits of audio elsewhere is that's not a lost art that's still no you know, as you said Simon, i think editing. i think finding good alts i mean if you if you're in the luxury of having a good assistant working with you i had joe on the last film and um you know, you can do a track. I do like a notes track within Pro Tools and say alt here and I go through the film. And then Joe um, went through all the takes. We'd look cross-reference from the sound sheets, the marked up script, get the reels and go through and lay out every time that person said the word tree, say, um, in that scene and lay them all at the correct time code. So I could just flip between and go, okay, that sounds pretty much exactly the same performance. And I can just swap that out for the tree um, line that um, had the noise on it or was off mic or crackled or broke up or was unclear. As Simon said, you know, clarity is our key thing. We need everybody to understand every syllable, if that's intended, um, that people say on set. I think that shows the difference in how uh, each dialogue editor will have their own um, approach and totally... Mm they're all valid and, and uh, I would tend to see how clean I could get that take that they chose and then go to alts for the S's mm. the T's, or the ends of sentences and because you have to flag every change like yeah. that and they're gonna be like why has she gone to another take mm, so yeah. do it and totally and you probably get the best result from that, but yeah, I mean, I would only do it for maybe literally where, say there was a crack or something, the inspector repair, boom, it was not working. I would literally just, I, I always try to only insert a different take for the shortest amount of time. And then I colour it red so that at any point from the beginning of my edit to the end of the final mix, I can immediately go, oh, yeah, sorry, I had to replace that. On another track below is the original named. Again, I will click group it and name it and say uh, original, you know, tree. Uh, replaced because of crackle distortion, which I couldn't get rid of. So there's, there's always, you always have the answer to a question that the editor, the producer, the director, or the, or the uh, re-recording mixer might ask you. It's been able to explain why you did what you did. Because if you lose trust, or sorry, if they lose trust in you, and they think you've gone willy-nilly through stuff, the whole atmosphere can break down and uh, it can all get a bit yeah, not very pleasant. So yeah, make sure you know exactly why you did everything and can trace it back. And basically just do as little as possible. So like if you need to swap a B out on the start of a yeah. word, you literally just take that B. Or the, yeah. If someone's mumbled the start and end of um, like the word bad or whatever, just like just get the tiniest amounts and swap it so you can you do have to be able to justify sometimes mm. why, why you've done stuff. And it's nice, as you say, keep track, make sure you, you keep a sort of note for yourself of why you've done stuff and just do the least possible. Um, uh, so that brings us nicely on to uh, bringing Callis into the discussion. Um, hello. hello, Callis. Callis is uh, a master with ADR. Um, so I'd like to talk to you a little bit about that process um, so we're starting to edit all the sound. Um, we need some technical ADR and production will ask for some uh, creative ADR, which will be changing lines or adding lines across the shoulder to explain things or anything. Um, so talk us through a bit about that process of the actual prepping of it, how you decide what's ADR. Um, do you have to talk to a mixer, the re-recording mixer, before you say this is unsavable, that sort of thing? <laughs> well, it depends if I'm doing the job on my own or not. Sometimes we work together with a dialogue editor that's working originals and they'll, and maybe they'll assess the originals. If I'm doing it all myself, then I'll make my list of 
and the technical stuff that I can't fix. I feel it's too off mic or we haven't got an, an alt for that's going to work or what have you. So we'll, have, we'll get that technical list. Um, and then there'll be the clarity stuff where you can't quite catch a line. And that, that's really crucial because it's that first instance of not understanding a line that's really, that's really, really crucial. Because if you, once you've read the script, once someone's told you the line, you're going you're gonna to know it. But it's that first instance for the audience that's crucial. So, if, so that's a clarity line. People don't like to hear those. Don't, don't want to get that news because if you've been working on the, on the show for so long, you know it inside out, you know those lines, but an audience won't and they're going to they're miss it. So that's important. So we do all that technical stuff. But if you've had a spotting session, ideally, um, the director and whoever will flag other stuff that's an issue. Maybe it's accent. Often actors aren't always playing their, their, own, their own accent, so they'll be playing different accents and sometimes that, that will drop. And so you need, to, you need to keep an ear out for that stuff and write that stuff up. Um, loads of added lines to help the story go through. And then, then of course, there's um, breaths of vocalising, which is a very emotional part of the, of the game. Um, so there's that as well. So we'll do a, we'll do a bit of, a lot of that as well, I think. So that's, that's also part of the, uh, the, the ADR list that you'll write up. And um, tell us about actually shooting the ADR. So I've actually got a session which I'll share with everyone after we've all spoken, just to talk through the actual tracks within Pro Tools, um, ADR prep, whatever. So you've prepped your ADR, you've ended up, I've got a load of sheets uh, lying around here because I'm busy at the minute. You get sheets like this from a software called EddieQ. So we've got the takes here, we've got the line for the actor and the scene and whatnot. Uh, these are the sheets you'll take to a session and you give them to the actor, and then they start. Uh, talk about... Well, you, get, you, you get three different kinds of sheets. You get a sheet for the director with some reasons on it for why, why it's been written up as a, a line of ADR. You get sheets for the engineers, which would take, take um, places for the takes, and then you'll get sheets for the actors, which don't always have all the reasons, because sometimes you don't want to put on their performance, or not just for political reasons, but also it's just distracting. They just want to see what the words are, and they, do, and they, and they want to do those. So, some, so you have different sheets for different people going into the ADR sessions. Uh, also, the other thing that I often try and find in quite a few jobs recently, there's been quite a few cheated lines. Sometimes, uh, you know, things you'd never, you ne would never get away with. And say, if you're going to go for ADR, um, it's quite good to try and find the true sync sometimes. Mm. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad, because when the actors heard what the original was against what you're trying to get them to do, they might not want to do that ADR line. However, it's quite good for timing sometimes to hear what the original line was so that they can sculpt the new line around the syllables of the original line, if that's not too convoluted. Yeah, and often we would record that, that line for them as a temporary placeholder. So one of us would yeah. put it in there and then show them how we'd like it fitted. Yeah. Uh, so talk about the actual recording, because um, obviously there's quite a lot of actors who um, are a bit nervous about why they haven't to redo stuff. Certainly, as you've mentioned, accent things. If you've got an Aussie playing an American, it's very hard for Aussies to change like that. Um, and obviously, there's some American ones, but... Uh, so you have to be very politically careful about how you approach things. Um, oh yeah, yeah, that's a, it is a, that is a hot potato. Um, yeah, I, I, had, I had five years ago, there was a production decided that they didn't like somebody's Southern American accent. He was an Australian and um, nobody wanted to go to the ADR session. So, <laughs> so, I, so I was there at 7.30 in the morning to, on Source Connect to the other side of the world. So just to mention to this actor that we're going to tweak his performance a little bit and um, just take the curse off the slightly heavy Southern American accent. So yeah, that is a that is a dodgy one to to get into sometimes with some actors. Often it helps to have a voice coach if there's the availability of one because they'll have yeah. a way of saying it. Yeah, so actors really like to lean on a voice coach if they can. I mean, I've got somebody recently that's. Uh, playing Dutch, but they're not saying too much Dutch, but they just still want to have somebody there that can just give them a way to say the English with a kind of slightly Dutch inflection. And that's, that's, that's quite useful as well. And yeah, but, um, so talking about ADR and getting actors in there that aren't very comfortable with it, 
Uh, yeah, we have wipes, we have beeps, and um, also we have hear and repeat, which I think is a really good way to, to help people that aren't very comfortable mm -hmm. doing ADR. They can just hear the line. And if they've got an ear for the rhythm, just have to repeat it and try and get a bit of movement into it and a bit of breath around the line, and that can, can help them get over the, 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 the technical aspect of going into a, a, a stale studio that's got no atmosphere to it. It's very hard to recreate, recreate a performance for some people, I think. It is. It is. Like, nobody likes ADR. I mean, a few actors might say it's great. It gives me the chance to revisit something because I was too focused on the camera or whatever. But yeah. fundamentally, yeah, no one likes it. We don't. The actors don't. The directors don't. Because um, it is hard to recreate it. And some people are amazing at it. Like, just you wouldn't believe. Some people are, yeah. Uh, I mean, some people it, like it, to tweak, tweak their performance. I'm just thinking about there's a couple of times where I've had people coming in and saying, you know what, I want to revisit that scene because th this was a scene I shot at the beginning of the, of the shoot and I hadn't quite got tuned into my character and I was a bit brittle here or I, was, I wasn't quite, I found the character further down the line. So I want to go back to that scene and I just want to just tweak a few inflections and a, bit, and a little bit. And, and if you're really good, you can do that. You can still keep the rhythm and you can still keep the performance and just... Just, just tweak it a little bit, and some, so some actors actually do embrace that ADR and can get a lot out of it. And you can come out of it with an with an improved performance. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sorry, I just got somebody at the door. What do you want? Yeah, no, that's right. So, um, every everyone else, I think what it is one of the biggest parts of our jobs to be um, a sort of personality in the ADR that just doesn't inflame things, and it it's quite a hard thing to do. So um, just talk about how you cope with difficult situations in ADR. So, Becky. Why are you asking me particularly? <laughs> <laughs> because we... Because I have the renowned story, which I won't be repeating. No, 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 but, uh... You won't be. <laughs> no, I won't be. Um, I think it's that thing. It's like any kind of group dynamics. You've got to every... ADR session is different because you've got a different mix of people in there. I mean, it's always good to have a bit of a heads up if there was any animosity on set between the actor and the director, because sometimes the, they kind of come into the room and they're either hugging and all over each other and the best mates, or there's just the most horrible atmosphere. And that's when you end up kind of generally running the session more than the director and kind of mediating between the, the two personalities. But I'd say you've just got to read the room read people's personalities, how they're reacting. Is the actor any good at ADR or are they hating every moment? And if you ask them to do one more take, the whole thing is just going to fall to pieces and you're not going to get all the other lines that you need to get. So I would say to try to be, to pick up on, on watch everybody, which is why ideally when I'm doing Source Connector ICN, I always have a camera. So you can just see the body language. Is that person just getting really frustrated? Because, you know, sometimes they're asked to do new lines and they really hate doing them because they don't believe that, you know, the narrative needs it. They might be asked to change their performance. And so you've got to judge how everybody's feeling and that you've got to get to the end of the day and get all the lines that you need. So. You could do a lot worse than the old compliment sandwich, just, uh, just as a tip. Um, it, 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 sandwich. Yeah, it helps to um, go in, you know, oh, that was, that was great. That I really felt like that, that was uh, coming across great. I'll tell you what, we'd like to really stay in touch with your character in particular. I wonder if you could just do a little more projection. You know, there's ways of... Um... Yeah, re I think reassurance is one of the big things you can tell. And, uh, you know, you can tell when they come in the room. I mean, I've had some actors just say, I'm not doing what's written down on these sheets. Immediately they come in, which is a great start. Um, and then you can also tell from the moment, the first line, you know, that first take with an actor that you never work with, the first take of ADR, and like, oh my gosh, this is just going to, and immediately you just start striking lines off the sheets going, that, we're never going to get that, we're never going to get that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's moulding your expectations to the situation. So you couldn't say that that is the way you've got to do it. But as Rachel said, I think, reassurance, coaxing, making them feel safe in that environment and that their performance isn't going to be destroyed. That's yeah. the biggest thing, I think, for both the director and the actor, that, you know, it's as good, if not better, than the original, which is quite difficult and quite time-consuming to do. It's a weird job. 
it's, sorry, I was just going to say, it's such a weird position to be in. There's not many other jobs on the film set other than the director where you are potentially having to coax a performance out mm. of someone and you're not an actor. They know you're not an actor. Yeah, and they've never met you sometimes. I mean, you just turn up. Well, they turn up and they've never met you and you're telling them or asking them to perform in a different way. Yeah, so yeah, it's a strange one. You've been staring at their performance day in, day out for six months sometimes. Mm. You know it off by heart and you know exactly mm. what you need them to do. So mm -hmm. it's just getting them to trust you. It's, it's a tightrope. It, it can it's be... It's true. And the, uh, someone said in the chat, and they're quite right, actors can be quite fragile. But uh, that, that's not necessarily an insult. I mean, imagine it. You walked in... All eyes are on you. You've got all this headspace of what was going on in the set if you're an actor and, and, and your performance. This is maybe the first time you've seen yourself in this movie. You're thinking, oh, do I look weird? Do I sound weird? And there's mm -hmm. the four strangers going, yeah, mm -hmm. go again, please record. You know, it's crazy for an actor psychologically. Yeah. So you, mm -hmm. it's, it's all about making them feel as comfortable and, and, and calm as possible. That said, you've turned up to get these lines. It's the mm. easiest thing in the world when the director says, oh, I don't think we need this. And the actor's like, I don't think we need this to go, yeah, okay, we don't need this. And everyone's happy. And then you get to the mix and it sounds like trash. Yeah. And you know you needed it. And, and so you, you, sure, you can drop some of the low priority lines from your list, but you, you, you've, got, you've got to kind of f find a way to navigate the, po the politics of it. And I don't, it's not being sneaky. It's just going, look, what does this person need to hear to make them trust that we're not we we have no agenda to undermine their performance we want to make them look as cool and as amazing as possible and this line's going to help and and finding a way to explain that to the actor that like we just want to make you look awesome i think that's when that's when the adr mixer can really help you in the studio yeah. i think mm. you, you do need to you need you do need allies in the room yes. and you know and when that person is also in tune with what you need they will, play, they will play, it, play it again to the actor and say, look, and maybe turn it up a bit louder so they can hear the shash or what have you. And, and that's going to help as well, I think. And it's also, you, 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 sometimes you, you build up a kind of secret language with the director where you know what he, they really want. But sometimes they don't want to say it, but they want you to say it for them. Mm -hmm. And you get that thing going where they, they might ask you again, do you, are you sure you're happy? And what they really mean is, can we go again? I don't want to say it myself. And you, you mm. have that kind of secret language where you have to kind of, yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of room reading goes on in an ADR studio, that's for sure. Yeah, it is just navigating all the personalities, but as Simon says, you, you've you gone with this list in your hand and you don't want to leave the room without it. I mean, some of us here have had people throwing microphones across rooms, the actors going, you've got the actor and the director saying, who can't understand that? And like, you've got to be able to say with honesty, look, I, I don't understand it, but if the director, the producer, and the actor are saying we're not doing it, then you, you've got to just go, you, you write it on your sheet, so it's all about, as Becky says, um, being able to keep track of all your decisions, you write on the sheets that they just didn't want to do it. Yeah. Wouldn't do it. But it, it, there, are, there are times when it is hard, where certainly if an actor's playing a different accent, and I've, I've worked on a thing where the actor had two voice coaches in the room with him, and, and the director who spoke in the same accent as this guy's character. So he had three people advising him on this accent and his ADR was getting quieter and quieter and quieter because all he was doing was the accent, was the vowels. Mm -hmm. The whole performance was completely gone. And you're like, we've got to get it a bit louder. It's got, so then we've already done 20 takes to get some vowels that sound right. And now you're like, right, we've got the accent. Now we need to perform it. So, and then everyone goes, but we've got it. But fundamentally, it has to work. It has to be good for the film. And if the accent goes a bit wonky, but the performance is amazing, that's way preferable to something that's just way too quiet and you can't believe it. Another thing is early on, if they say, oh, we're not doing these lines, and you go, okay, I've lost that battle, and you, and you work through the session, and then maybe you do some, and, you, and you're collaborating with the actor well, and you know, you've, you've won them over, to a certain extent, I don't mean won them over in some Machiavellian way. I just mean you've become, you've, you've developed a good working relationship. You can say maybe at the end of the session, look, can we just have one last chance look at this 
other scene that we didn't do at the start. I just, you know, now that we're doing everything so well and you've really got into the rhythm of it, I think you could do a good job with this one now and suddenly you can get it. And so what you thought, oh God, I never got that scene. You got it, you got it. So, you know, never give up. You can you can sometimes find a way to wheel around and, and get something again, you know, and- uh, I do that, you know, like when you get some dodgy ADR at the beginning of the session. Yeah. Huh. And then I make little stars on it, and then at the end, as you said, if it's all gone well and everybody's kind of great Everyone. friends in the ADR theatre, and they're like, "Yeah, I've got some great stuff." Okay, do you know what? I just think, you know, that first line. I reckon just one more take. I reckon you could totally nail it. And then, but just if you're notes. not lying, it's true. Yeah, because yeah. like, no, you just go. They yeah. relax now and they'll nail it, and they do, and yeah. it's great. and they do, yeah, and it's worth it. But as you said, it's the politics; it's choosing your battles, when and how and if, and yeah. Yeah, you don't um, want to start the session with an emotional scene either. I mean, yeah. people need to warm up a little bit. So, yeah, and I, I was thinking, if you if an actor's got say twelve lines in a scene, and certainly um, on the bigger Hollywood things, you break it down really into small sections, like tiny lines at a time. So that might be 12 different cues and they'll do each one in a row and you'll think they've nailed it and and everyone's sort of happy and you go, get to the end of the session, then go, right, let's go, mm -hmm. let's do the whole thing as a run. Yeah. Just, you've got it in your head, you've got the rhythm, let's just, because doing it one line at a time is very often, you just don't get that flow and it just doesn't feel right. Whereas to get a nice long flow of all the lines together um, is usually, it gives you, just an extra added layer of um, good performance and believability. Um, and you don't necessarily have to use any one of those takes or all of the ones, or, or the, you know, you, once you get it back, it, then suddenly all, all the tools are available to you. You can go, you know what, I'm going to go from this take to that take, which sounds completely crazy. But if it's natural, it's natural. And you can yeah. make it go naturally. If you've got an ear for that melody of the, the performance you want, you, you'll get it and you can stitch it together, especially if you've got a director who trusts you to do that. You know, not all directors will. They'll go, I want take four. And you're like, okay, well, I guess I'm lining up take four. But if they say, look, have a play with it, offer me some good options, then you, 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 you can go, well, I know I got the first half nailed in take three and the second half nailed mm. in take seven. So we're good. That's why the sheets that Steve showed, you know, with all the takes and, you yeah. know, we. I just, we just make copious notes because again in the final mix often the directors will say oh I thought there was a better take than that so you want to be able to just open your sheets go right yes there was it was 16 takes she also liked take 11 so yeah as you can see from Steve's that's what mine but, like. gosh yeah. you've got a lot of takes going on there yeah, yeah. but you, you'll be able to go to it and you'll also because when you're in the session as, as Simon was saying you might go I think that take one was great for the first two words take five and then the end is brilliant on take eight and when you're editing you want those notes as your reference to what you were thinking at that point when you were recording the ADR. And what, what's amazing about the ADR facilities like Goldcrest you mentioned before Rich, um, Delaine Lee uh, and all the others um, which I forgot, uh, <laughs> they have usually an assistant um, to the recordist who will stitch all that together so you'll get to the end of it and um, the director can say, can here, take four, and then he might go, eh. so then you go, right, take two, four, five, seven, and the assistant, they're also nimble now with Pro Tools, um, they'll stitch all that together and play it, and the director goes, brilliant. So from the ADR stage, they'll leave that on a select track, so you know when you get it back that it's been played back in the recording theatre, and everyone was happy with it, and it's already kind of done for you. The other thing I'm I'd say is, oh, sorry. No, please, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, because I know it's relevant to just what we're talking about. So Joshua Silverlock has said, do directors ever come to ADR sessions to help alleviate some of these issues? If not, do you think it would help or would you find it annoying? Um, depends on the that, director. As I was about to say, it totally depends on the director and how helpful they are. Uh, some don't particularly have an ear for it and will go, uh, which is what happened with some of the issues in some of ADR sessions, you know, We'll, we'll question why we are doing it and then kind of undermine you. Um, so that can be very problematic, but then you can have another director who's totally behind you, who will back you up on whatever you say. And those are the directors that you want at the ADR session. Yeah. Some of them, the others can kind of get in the way of the process. So, but a good, a, a, an actor, a, sorry, a director who's very good with actors and has a good ear 
can be brilliant for alleviating any of these problems in ADR. And then you can just get left with looking for sync, matching projection tone, and they can deal with all the politics. Of, of the it room. really depends how they see it. If they see ADR as a chance to uh, change or improve even the performance, and that really helps if they go in mm. positive. A lot of, um, a lot. Some directors go in like it's a technical process. Why are we here? And and same with actors. If you go in negative like that, it's it can be not. It's going to be bad. It's a self fulfilling prophecy. Mm. And if you're giving that signal to the actor, that's really not helpful. It's really unhelpful. I've but had I it, 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 those, those political maneuverings. I say political. I keep trying to say it's not. It's not Machiavellian. It, it really is just people skills or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, they do take ages. I've screwed up so many times in ADR session. I just go, why did I say that? <laughs> and not only that, just this week, I walked in with a list of 20 cues. I got one. So yeah. it's not like I've, I've nailed it. it. This is a lifelong battle. And you're just, I'm, I'm thrilled. I got the one. I got it. You know. Yeah, sometimes I come out and it's just drains you, the walking on eggshells, the like, trying to work out how to describe it, that you need the line done again and the politics of the room. And then other times you all come out and you're high-fiving each other, kind of going to we all go for a drink. So it's just... Yeah, it can be you, actually the most, uh, the biggest opportunity for you to get to know the director and for them to yes, remember. Thing. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. The other effects guys don't get this. They don't get this sort of FaceTime you yeah, get. by the time you get to the stage for the final mix, the, the, the one person when the director walks in is the one person he knows is you and you can be like, hey, how's it going? Good to see you. And it, it, it bonds the whole room. Suddenly you've got like, you're a team. So yeah, it's a really good opportunity for that. So it's not all bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I've, I've had a few occasions where the director falls asleep and they're literally sitting with the actor in the same room snoring. And you're like, how do I wake them up? because the microphone's picking up the snoring, but they're a bit touchy. <laughs> just going, what do I do? Like, I can't just go in and give him a nudge, but this particular guy just kept falling asleep. Like, I'd be texting him. Yeah. Always politics. And as Simon says, it doesn't change either. You don't ever get to a point where you're like, I, I've made it, I've done it, I'm there. Everything I do is great. We all question everything we do all the time like becky you you keep track of every decision you've made because at some point someone's going to question you and go why have you done that and you're like because of this and you won't remember really why you've done it because you've made twenty thousand decisions like that but to give yourself all these little notes on your session and make it easy for yourself um and the color coding Becky mentioned, I think that's great. I've got, mm. my whole, we, we should actually align our colors. We should really, shouldn't we? So, because I've got yeah, yellow for I'm noise all reduction. All yeah. Color for yeah. different, all, color for <laughs> process, color, color for this, yeah. color. Yeah. I'll yeah. send you my list, guys. You I, said, I, let's hear. So I've used Becky's colors, I've used Simon's colors. <laughs> I don't know, Steve, have you got colors? I guess. Uh, red, red for danger. Right, okay. <laughs> I use red for ad lines. So the yeah. Max and an Adeline, and he's definitely going to use that ADR not, not to drop it. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes Red, I do reading routes with great big arrows, basically going, yeah, use I this. That. So yeah. <laughs> I did that as well, yeah. Because uh, sometimes, because I, I work so much in TV, um, we don't always go to the mix. So I have to find ways to communicate with the mixer. And I've had a great relationship with the director. I know a lot of what he wants, he or she wants. So, I, 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 so how do I get that across to the mixer who's, got a very short amount of time to get all this mixed. And there's a whole load of stuff here. So I, I've got notes all over the place. I did have yeah. a session with um, Chris Burden where he says, actually, I don't read, read region, region groups, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just take that out. So I had to, he I, so I had to go to the for him. So uh, yeah, it depends who you're, who you're mixed with. He's got to find a different way to communicate with whoever. Yeah, actually, I have worked with a lot of mixers, as far as track lane goes, that just want it as simple as possible. So when you say you're stacking up all the different stages of processing, that will do some mixers' mm. heads in when you... you but then they're always muted and dragged down, do you know what I mean? So there's only <laughs> one pathway. Whenever I present tracks, which I think I was going to come to in a minute, actually, for the pre-mix or whatever, there is an absolute definite path. So even if there's options, they're there and they're clearly labelled, but they're muted. 
So a mm. decision is made, which I think is the right one. But then when you get to the premix, you can see from all your notes, you're like, okay, well, I went with this, but because I thought the original cleaned up was good, but actually I think we might ADR. So can I flip? So you then unmute, you know, you're, you're, you're presenting, but not at the same time, because it's confusing for the mixer and for you, because even though you think you'll know why you were doing it that way, you're like, oh, I can't remember which one I wanted to use now. So yeah, well, that, labor. Uh, that is a big difference, as Carla says, with TV and features, where uh, on a feature, unless we're shooting ADR or whatever, we would all go to the pre-mix with the re record mixer and then the final. So we can talk through all of those things, all the things you've labeled and you've offered alternatives for, you, you can talk through and show the, the different options and make a decision there and then. But as Calla says, often on telly, you, we all just work from home, you just send it in, you never go to the mix, you, you don't do anything. So um, you have to almost be more paranoid and more um, informative to just say, um, tell everyone why you've done certain things or just what they are. Um, so uh, on to the next little bit, Rachel, um, again, it feeds into sort of the TV and film thing. On, on TV, we would um, say have a couple of weeks to do an episode, whether you're doing dialogue originals or ADR or whatever, if it's on a, a reasonably high profile thing, um, and then you move on. On a feature, you could be on it for three, four, five, six, nine months. But you are still just as busy on a feature, just chasing temp mixes for screenings. Um, so what, what production do is they come with a version of the film they like. They say, right, it's ready to test. They um, do a temp mix, which is where they get all the different departments together and do a mini final mix, send it off to um, somewhere in the States or London, wherever. They test an audience, get an, a recruited audience who give feedback and a score on that film. And from that feedback, the producers then recut the film, try to work out any issues that have been flagged. People didn't like the lead character and you can't have that. So you try and the editor will warm them up by making them smile a bit and not be so horrid or whatever. Um, and then they retest it and then they retest it again. And that could go on for five or six different times. And every time they do a temp mix to go to a screening, we have to do these recuts where we have our session at version one and the temp mix is going to be version two. So Rachel, talk us through that process. All right, so uh, when it's time to recut, uh, they will tell you you've got a turnover coming. Simon mentioned the turnover right at the beginning. It's the same thing, basically. They will give you new picture, usually a little shorter than the old picture. They will give you new guides that they've uh, exported from the Avid, and they will give you um, their AAF, as Simon mentioned, with basically what's in your guide track, all broken out into how they see it in the AVID, and they will give you an EDL. Now, on films, we tend to have an assistant, uh, and it, it's, uh, we're very fortunate to have one, and he will take the EDL, and he will put those guide tracks that you had on the old long cut through something called, we use Conformalizer, it's a software that will look at the EDLs, see the changes between that EDL and the previous old EDL, and it will make a cut guide. So you can look at that and go, oh, look, they've trimmed here, 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 they've extended that, they've trimmed this, this, this. You can then get your session, and we do it manually, but people differ. You then group all your tracks and cut everything into sync. It's a very time consuming process, but you wanna, follow that guide track and cut everything so it all lines up. You Any new bits, you, you work on the new bits. Any bit that have been cut up, you usually keep the bits that were cut out, chuck them up the end somewhere because you might need them again. And then, uh, tends to be if there's another temp mix coming up, you have to check all your automation as well. Make sure all your volume graphing and things. When you cut into automation, it, nodes can ping up and things can go wrong all the time. So you have to keep an eye on that. And uh, like I said, we do all this manually and we do that because if you run it through Conformalizer, that's fine, but Conformalizer is gonna look at all the picture changes and just slam it. All your, all your regions are gonna get all cut up and that's not necessarily what's happening to the dialogue. 
the dialogue doesn't just move wherever the picture moves because some people uh, do a two shot and then they cut to a wide shot, but they kept the audio from the two shot. Do you see what I mean? So although that pictures changed, the dialogue might not have changed and conformalizer would just, just crap all over that and cut it all up. So you don't want to do that. Really, you want to be as gentle as you can with it and see what they meant to do and what they overlapped. And the only way to do it properly is to do it manually. So that's what we all do. Yeah, so you, you're sort of just comparing the new AAF with the old AAF. Mm -hmm. And like a jigsaw, you like group all your session tracks with the old AAF and go, that bit moves to there, that bit moves to there. And as you say, they might have changed a take so the audio has changed, but the picture take hasn't changed. And conformalizer would see, oh, it's a new picture, just get rid of that. Whereas you know, because you can see in their new AF, it hasn't changed, so you can just leave it. So it's just like cutting up and moving it around like a jigsaw. Each bit, um, you just make the old AF look like the new one and work on the bits in between, which are new. But that could be, we have times when they're every two or three weeks, those 10 mixes. So you have this, really hard push to the tent mix and then it goes down for a week and then it ramps up again and that can go on for months and months um, and that's a lot of our work where you might do six weeks hard push at the start get through the whole film editing and then spend three months just recutting not doing very much creative apart from maybe shooting some ADR. I would add that it's uh, yeah, it's a laborious um, process, and you have to be really careful that you don't change things from the new guide track. As things can slip through because it just looks identical on the guide track, but it's slightly different. So you've got to you've got to be careful. I' gonna admit online to my peers, I like the process of recutting. I have a no. I, I agree. I quite like it. It's, it's <laughs> like playing Tetris. And I yeah, just it love it. You pull it, and, and sometimes I'll go to sleep just moving these blobs in my mind in sync with each other, and I actually get a kick out of it. But I think, as Rachel said, a very good tip is to anything that you cut out, put it further down the timeline, because they will often, particularly on, be really trying different. It might go non-linear, so a scene that was there is suddenly now at the beginning, and you go, "Oh, it was cut out." But actually, it's it's much further down, whatever. So keep everything like a copy of it further down the timeline in case you need to reference back to it because they do a bit like the hokey pokey, pokey pokey, hokey cokey. They kind of in and out with scenes and different lines or whatever. So you don't yeah. want to have to redo your work again. And certainly, some directors might do like 120 turnovers. Like you could, mm. it could be a phenomenal amount. So you certainly have to be able to go backwards and and find stuff that you did earlier. Because the one thing none of us want to do is redo stuff we've already done, because that's horrible. Um, it's weird though. I, you'll find in any one film there'll be a line of dialogue, maybe two or three, that change from one take to a different take, back to the take it was, back to the first alternative. But just they cannot make their minds up about this take, and it changes back and forth and back and forth. Every movie's got a take like that, and it just. You just go, okay, well, I've got them both ready and I know what, whatever it is. And just what is, what will it be this time? It just, you just, you just, why can't they make the decision? But they can't. And actually and a good tip to do is uh, say you've got the old guide track conformed underneath the new one to the same length. Now you can invert, Simon, you were saying about this, you can invert the guide track against it. And so anything that is different between those will show up as yeah. a, as a new, uh, so if you've got a long stretch where for five minutes in theory there were no cuts and so the guide track's identical if you phase invert them you can go oh sneaky it's not identical they've changed something here and you go and look and go oh look so they just added a little extra line of ADR or they've just done a little something there and you can you can you can work that out which would probably be irrelevant to the sound effects department but to you it's like if you like that's our job is keeping track of them adding those lines and no one you won't get like a memo we've added a line here you've mm. just got to find it in the guide track you've just got to listen to that guide track it's your bible yeah and even volume pushes say yeah. they got we've constantly feed uh on our crew we constantly feed back how we're getting on back to the avid so uh if i've done a conform i'll bounce out everything in my in that reel as a mono and give it to them all the time 
put it in your avid, put it in your avid. So they're working with your actual sounds, getting used to what you've done, all your alts, all your cleanup. And that means that if they say, oh, you know what, those, those scenes there need to be 2 dB louder, they do that. And the next time I get it back from them in the AAF, I'll, I'll um, do that yeah. as well to mine. I'll put mine up 2 dB. So next time they're back to zero. And we just do this roundabout thing. Anything they've changed, I copy, send back to them. And it means- You would do that, Rachel, for as little as 2 dB? Yeah, uh, not for that, but when we next bounce, it will be included. Huh. Yeah, yeah. I like to do an idiot check, I call it, um, before any temp mix or pre-mix or final, where I get my session, I play um, the guide track, the production dialogue guide track from the cutting room out the left speaker, route all my tracks out the right speaker, press play and just sit and listen. And if it's the same as it should be, everything comes out the middle. As soon as, say, I might have messed up a re could be a frame out or whatever, or I've forgotten a line, it jumps out really obviously. So you just wake up and go, oh, I've missed something. And it's amazing how many times you'll realize you've cut something out where you didn't mean to. It could just be as little as a breath or something, but you just want mm -hmm. to, again, make sure in a final mix that's getting a bit tense, someone shouts, why is that line or that breath or whatever? Why is that not there? It's just another kind of safety net. And that's all we're doing is is sort of helping us um, kind of get everything that they want and make sure nothing's missing. Uh, but yeah, idiot check works well. Um, okay, so Becky, we've got the finished tracks now. We've got everything assembled. We've got all the ADR. Oh no, uh, Simon, you're going you, yeah. to talk about crowd. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah. that bit. So I'll quickly talk about crowd. I, I, I won't spend too long because we've been rabbiting on. But um, crowd uh, is also called loop group, and it's basically getting a load of people in a room and recording whatever you like. That, that's basically what it is. And um, but um, it's called loop group because they used to have to put loops. I guess looping ADR used to be ADR is often called looping. And they have to. They used to have to put loops of the line they wanted and of, of, of actual film on the projector. Doesn't matter, but you'll hear it referred to as loop group. Um, so the most basic reason you'll need it is, you know, if you're recording dialogue, say it's a scene between me and Steve, and we're in a pub, has never happened, honest, and we're just uh, sharing a bit on location. All the people in the background in the pub would have been told to keep quiet because it's most important just to record me and Steve, and they'll just be pretending to chat. And so all you do is you record this. Obviously, you can have sound effects of, of pubs, but if it's a more bespoke environment, you, you just get everyone, six, seven, ten people in a room and say, pretend you're in a pub, put a microphone up, you're done. And I put that behind me and Steve, play it a little quieter than would be natural so we can hear me and Steve poking out above it. Um, but, but that's basically what you do, those, those beds. But actually, you can be getting a lot more interesting stuff than just a background bed you might be recording police radio transmissions if there's if it's a cop movie or whatever and so or or an army movie and you'll just be hearing like th those cool sounds in the background of you know maybe some of those may be plot related that can be some fun stuff to add you maybe have one or two actors with small parts who you're not going to get back in for ADR and you just go okay revoice that these four characters who are sort of somewhere between characters and, and extras in terms of actors but for whatever reason they can't track them down it's going to be a pain we just record it in loop group and sometimes you get the actor back in and have it do it but sometimes that loop group performance stays in the movie you'll have I don't know about you guys but I more often than not these days I'll be recording in a crowd scene singles so you'll get a, a lot of if, if you've say got say uh Rachel's film, 1917, you'll be in the trenches and in between the line of dialogue, you'll just want to be hearing, hey, don't they bring those guys over here or whatever. You know, a big mushy bed actually is not that helpful around the dialogue. You want to hear those little tiny little bits of detail in and around everything. You don't listen, you'll just hear them on the wind. So, well, sometimes they'll feature nice front and center dialogue, but 
a lot of stuff and 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 what can just be 10 little call outs actually could just add the real detail to a scene um peppered through just the, just those single call outs or or, or maybe couples walking by because these people who, who get brought in are actors and so maybe they'll they'll perform together if it's a scene where there's a lot of people walking past frame and you'll just have them go okay it's 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 1917 france don't talk about ipods don't swear here you go walk left to right and and you just maybe record 10 wild or you maybe specifically say okay those two let's pick them out and you, you, you people approach it differently whether you just record a load of walk bys for the movie or you go okay i'm going to pick out each particular one you'll be doing things like vocal effects screams and stuff for monsters and stuff with the crowd that can be a load of fun and um also sometimes in in the background of 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 those scenes in a pub say or whatever there's someone who very specifically you can see their lips going and you're like oh god and there's no well, there's no microphone near him on the day but it, he's really standing out and we're gonna have to find something what do you think he's saying and you can loop over that footage again and again going oh, what could he be saying what could he be saying and and you work out something that could could fit on that guy and all that lady and and you record that and so suddenly if anyone's eyes happens to be on that background person they don't stand out and um You'll tend to work with a cast, a voice casting person. You'll speak to them, okay, this film's set in 19th century Egypt, so we need some authentic voices there. Or there's a scene in Germany, but it's all posh people in Germany, and they'll help you get the right people to turn up to the session to, to cover. You'll maybe get six people to turn up who will be covering 20 different, I say 20, you know, a, a background of 20 people. And so often the same voice might pop up, especially if one or two is not good, but these, these are never going to be featured voices as such. They'll just kind of be blurbering away in their background. So you'll get the different um, performance. It can be tricky getting the actors to do less. I don't know about you guys. I often find they'll be enjoying performing the scene and, and it, it can they can be too interesting, can't they? Simon? They can be too interesting. You don't want them to be more interesting than your story as i'll be going you know okay you're in a pub so why don't i have an argument with my girlfriend hey what were you doing? like yeah that happens in a pub but we're trying to focus on this so ha please have a boring conversation hey terry how'd you get on with your job interview yesterday you know just uh, no one's interested keep it plain no, i mean um not tight it has to be sort of have energy and be at the right projection be at the right volume for the environment but you know not just vanilla vanilla is probably well, that sometimes it is about the right energy for the scene isn't oh, it? oh sure yeah it's not it, this isn't one size fits all but you know that that's some of the thing yeah Can and so no carry uh, on I thought you were done sorry no i'm just trying to think so yeah you the things you need to think about uh time you're going to need you're not going to take 20 in a loop group session you get to take three take four it you've got a lot you've got to cover a lot in a day because it's a expensive day recording all that stuff and they don't productions don't tend to want to pay for low for you to just be sort of meandering around and trying 20 different voices on each character yeah, the, the meters running in a crowd session. <laughs> yeah it's like the meters running and so actually the voice caster depending on your personality can be very helpful there keeping up keeping the um session moving getting it keeping everyone focused you know after six hours those actors are going to start getting tired and sort of getting sloppy and it's like no come on guys someone up now to record this line next person we need another line you know it's not like a, an army drill where you've got you there's no room for mucking around but it, it, it can be quite an intense day i don't know about you i find them quite stressful i find them exhausting i yeah. find them exhausting right. and, stressful. and uh, and you kind of have to be on your okay Hi everyone, I'm Simon, and you know you've got to keep that session going and going and going. going. It forward it's all day. It's exhausting. Day. And you've got maybe one group in the morning and another in the afternoon, and some and some people are there not because they can act, but just because they speak a particular language. Yeah. And, and someone's found them. You need twenty Somalis. Good luck for it. I mean, actually, we're very lucky in London. You, yeah. you can find a lot of different actors, but realistically, yeah. they're not all going to be actors. The, the voice casters can be very good at going around to community centers and, and sort of explaining what the situation is, finding the most 
um, outgoing people and saying, look, do you want to try this for a day? You'll get paid and you get some great people turn up. <laughs> I think, I mean, my biggest struggle is always if we're in the studio, not if we're shooting outside, which ideally we do, if it's in the budget and the time, but it's getting them to shout because obviously in a, in a studio, which is all quiet. So I spend, I tend to boom a lot of it myself. So I'm in with the crowd. And as you said, Simon, you know, you're getting singles. So you're just going round and round getting wild tracks of people shouting and some people just won't do it. So oh. I'm shouting at them, Lara, and, then, Lara, and just like that. And you said, by the end of the day, I'm just absolutely whacked out. But it, it does help shouting. if somebody, if you're shouting in somebody's face, they tend to shout back at you. So. Yeah, but and, and that volume can dip real quick. And it's the difference. Mm. Hey, I need some help here. I mean, that sounds pretty loud. Hey, I need some help here. Well, that's even louder. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it needs to be that. It does. It needs to be that. And, yeah. and, and, and two down from that. Sucks. Sounds yeah. boring. Yeah. You need to go to 11. It's spinal tap time. Yeah. And you said cajoling them into doing that, it, yeah. it takes a lot of work. Yeah. So I have an uh, example, if that helps. Oh, oh yes, Rachel. Yeah. Because <laughs> I made it. I, got, I want to show it. <laughs> <laughs> I learned iMovie. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is, surprise, surprise, 1917. I just want to show you let me share my screen. Uh, this uh, is the final clip and then I'll talk about it afterwards. Well done, lad. Thank you, sir. Do you know where Lieutenant Blake is, sir? Blake? There were two of us. I was sent here with his brother. Ah. Well. well done, lad. Thank you, sir. Do you know where Lieutenant Blake is, sir? Blake? There were two of us. I was sent here with his brother. Well, knowing Lieutenant Blake, he would have gone over with his men. He was in the first wave. How could I find him, sir? You could try the casualty clearing station behind the line. Otherwise... Thank you, sir. So, Fantastic. let me uh, also show you before I talk that the guys you were hearing uh, were these guys. Now, this is our crowd guys. Uh, there's me and uh, one of our recordists. We filmed on the back lot of Shepperton Studios where before Netflix took it over. And uh, it has a lovely natural slap of all the buildings around it. And um, what we did is have a five hour ray around the edge of this field and we, we had this is a world war one stretcher they happen to have and we had them carrying each other up and down running all around the place uh, when there's a triage scene in the hospitals they were lying on the ground in pain and what's key, uh, key about why i liked this crowd so much is half of these guys are actual territorial army so nice. although we have the voice actors who give it the projection and the performance we need uh, you've got the real some of these are medics even trained guys who they they know how to be military and sometimes it helps to blend half actors and half non-actors um if you can uh you get lucky sometimes more than others but uh, these guys were great and it was the hottest day of the year and they were exhausted and but uh, just to show you uh an example and also what helps with crowd I found is to have some kind of cheat sheet for them. I don't want to write scripts, but to give them, uh, especially with period things, uh, to give them ideas of what to talk about. Um, military terms uh, was a key one because we didn't want them saying, oh, you know, my iPhone's run out of battery. It's got to be some something you would have actually heard at the time. And Sam was very keen that if we're going to have crowd, for it to be as realistic as possible. And that's when you got to put your nerd hat on and really 
delve into um, World War One, as uh, we did on Phillips. We delved into um, naval terms and uh, and uh, Jason Bourne. There was a lot of CIA uh, chit chat, and it's not just made up. We try and find out as much as we can about all this to give them things to say, and it really helps if they've got a piece of paper in their hand that they can just glance down at and and riff on it means they're not going um uh you know you just get more out of them quicker and um i hate getting script i hate providing proper scripted lines for crowd but just having just general sheets that they can riff on is much much better yeah i, I i'll be honest i often will write a lot so as we say different strokes for different folks i will write a lot and it's but i never say say this i'm like if you run out of something to say say this do you yeah. know what i mean these are the kind of things you can say feel free to use none of it, but it means they'll never run out of something to say. You know? Actually, the last few films I've done seem to have a lot of police comms in them, and we yeah. do have all that 10-4 and, and, uh, and codes, especially for the American police comms, um, that have to be accurate. And actually, I do fully write a, a call and a response. Or, uh, in uh, the Bond films, Becky, they, they have a lot of comms going on in the background, RAF and different things, and you can't, there's not a lot you can fully make up. No, if, I think if it's exposed, as you said, and it's, it's sort of any technicality, I want to get it as, I'm sure we all do, you know, as, as if, it, if, if it's audible that nobody can complain about it and go, well, they wouldn't have said that. So to actually kind of, again, sort of cover your back, really, to make sure that it is, but also, that, you know, I want to make it realistic that it is what they would have said. You know, on Darkest Hour, we actually researched what was being said on those different days where in the in war rooms, what was happening, what people would be talking about, which battles and, you know, strategies and stuff. So it, that actually made it a lot easier to do crowd that was um, believable and that you didn't worry. Because, you know, sometimes you have to cut out quite a lot of rubbish that people are saying because it's audible and you're like, oh, God, they're talking about their Auntie Joan or something. Whereas if you can actually have it written down in, you know, in particular instances, then you know what is said is true and if you can hear it and I think it helps the actor sometimes. I mean obviously as we said it totally depends on what the scene is. The best and, and as we saw in Rachel's great clip I love the sound of it and um, you're not really necessarily picking out anything but you just have that confidence that if anything yeah. does come out you go yeah. okay but it's it's the right stuff but mm. those voices on the wind you know that that's a classic. Yeah and you might have ordinarily you might have done all breaths for the guys running past and yeah. oh rip come on let's go you, you might have covered all that but i knew with that director with those clients they don't want your yeah. right then he's just running the situation the yeah. that's a really calm sad moment he they just want to hear these guys but you don't want the world outside to stop so you've got to have a, a, you've got to paint a certain color to it without going what's that what's that you know so yeah. It's a fine balance. Uh, right, uh, 10 past nine. Um, I think we have chatted a bit. Um, I think we'll skip the bit about the premix and final, o other than to say we then go through a premix and a final. Make final. Right. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> where all the departments come together and we um, make the final track. So, uh, could I ask everyone, what are your, what are the real pressure points or uh, times when there's most friction and how do you deal with them? Callis, I'll go with you first. Well, that's going to be in the ADR studio, I get, you know, isn't it? That's the only place where there's going to be conflict for me. Um, so, yeah, just if, it, if, it, if an actor doesn't want to do ADR and we really want to get it, then, then there's a lot, you can spend a session spending more time talking about it than doing it so uh, something like that that or if somebody has made a performance note that uh, maybe they, they shouldn't have that's that's an, that's an issue you have to be very careful to make sure that your that, that any notes that you're making are, are, are warranted and wanted as well so yeah you have to you have to just take temperature of the room that's that's you know, that's the place where it's, the, the, it's very dodgy i think yeah and rachel uh weirdly i i often have tension with the foliator because uh, well, Hugo. <laughs> any, there is only one, isn't there? <laughs> uh, because they often want you to move their PF, your PFX, the real stuff, to fit their feet uh, that they've recorded, which is might be Hugo specific, I don't know. But um, I find that often you're like, yeah, but this is the real sound. And so you might have a little battle with um, 
the guys on the other side of the room as to no 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 this is how that cup sounded when he put it slammed it down on the ground even though yours has got a nice toppy element so you can have a little friction there but usually you just mute yours and go with it <laughs> um simon uh oh i don't know I, we've all talked about the adr and those those things i i i don't know i think it's trying to um you know, maybe I'm missing an element, but you've got that sound quality, you know, it's, does it sound nice? You've got the performance of the actor and you've got the clarity of the words. Can we hear what they're saying? And it's like three dials and there's just no correct setting. And it's, and it's negotiating with all the people you're trying to who, who, who have who, who have an opinion and uh, who's ultimately the, the director but it's you know you'll you'll be playing it to your peers the sound supervisor the mixer so many different people will go no that's a bit too you've cleaned it up too much or that's still sounding too mucky or whatever you'll have your own opinion and it's it's just going to, okay how can we get every, everyone happy and just get it so that it's just right between those those elements that you know, ideally it's perfect on all three. It never is. So you just kind of, okay, well. Especially if we're in, in the room with one of those clients who says they do something, make it louder. And then the other client comes yeah. in and goes, why is it louder? And they go. And it's subjective, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes don't. it's tricky, yeah. And Becky. Becky? Becky? She's gone. She's gone, and she? Becky. Gone, um, everything's gone quiet here. Oh. Well, I don't know why. I'm going to leave and come back. Bye. Okay, cool. See you soon. Okay, uh, so the rest of you, um, what do you love most about your job? Rachel. Uh, I love most uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, you're given this film by the director and it's their baby most of the time. It's something that they treasure. It's their whole world for the past, could have been three years. And they have a scene say that they thought was unsavable. They are stressing out because they're gonna to have to get this actor back in to redo it all over again. And they really just loved it on the day. And then you are able to go, da da, and you give it back to them and they go, oh my God, I can hear everything again. It's amazing. When you can save a little portion of their little baby for them, it, it's, it's great. I love, I love surprising them. That's what I like. I'm back. Hello. Hey, Becky, can Hello. you hear us? I, yeah. I can hear you. I don't know what happened there. Uh, so, uh, Becky, tell me what you love most about your job. Um, back to the thing you were saying earlier, um, Steve, about the invisibility of it. And that sounds weird what I'm saying that, but what I mean is if you get a scene and it's really horrible and noisy and disgusting and you do a few bits of ADR in there, you put a good fill track in there, you manage to get some alts and a wild track and clean up some of the originals and you present it and everybody believes that's how it was on the day. So that is sort of bizarrely, I find that very rewarding. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do really like uh, working with actors doing ADR, even if they're a bit tricky. And um, working, you know, in the final mix, working as part of a team, and we've all got our different roles, but everybody's vital to lead to that point. And um, yeah, I'd say those. Yeah, I Did I miss what everybody else said, or was I the first one? Uh, no. I said it was fine. Callis, how about you? Yeah, well, I, yeah, I love being, working in, with actors in the ADR studio. It's really great. It's quite a privilege sometimes to be in there with them. And, and, and some, you know, when you've got really experienced actors, there isn't that much you need to do with them. But sometimes you've got somebody that isn't experienced and just helping them to get through that and get something great out of them. That's really, that's really rewarding. And then taking it, taking it back to, the, to your edit room and managing, managing to get something that may say something that's very emotive with a lot of shouting and screaming and you manage to get put that all together into something that's really good and you can take that into the studio, into the mix. That's rewarding, I think. Simon. Well, when I um, come home and Susie says, did you have a good day? I say, yes. I walked into my room. I spent eight hours dialogue editing. No one bothered me and now I'm home. I love it. <laughs> I just love it. It's just, you know, tinkering, 
as, as the other guys have said, no one's ever going to know you've done this stuff. You've got to get your own satisfaction out of it. Sometimes they do. Sometimes you'll save a scene. But the more um, meat and potato, just fixing a scene so that it plays nice and just like no one's ever going to ever mention it ever. And you just go, but I love it. I just know I've made that sound nice. And, and, and that's good. And sometimes in ADR, you have a stressful day, but you, you've sure got stories to tell your friends, right? <laughs> You, you know, speaking as someone who's, who's done a little bit of work on set, people go, oh, set's where all the action is, isn't it? You've got to get a job on set. I, I did it, and I've got to say, unless you love getting up at 5 a.m. and standing in the pouring rain at minus five degrees in a, a North Face jacket until 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night, with a bad back from holding up a boom as I was, uh, it, there's nothing better and more COVID-era suitable than our jobs because uh, we get a room each and like someone <laughs> says, it's great to just put your head down and, and get on with it and, and uncover all these lovely dialogues that people thought were ruined. It's really rewarding. What about you, Steve? I love um, the focus of it where I have to say we are all that we know, dialogue editors, you've got to be a certain personality where you can just sort of go in get focus and eight hours later you come out the tunnel again you're like oh my god it's five o'clock at night or something like you get so absorbed in what you're doing and it's it's absolute minutia and it is pretty much for ourselves we have to get our own joy from it we set our own standards often you wouldn't be able to hear the things we do a lot of them some of the things we do we probably wouldn't need to do but there's such a great satisfaction from just that focus and making something work and I love things like when you've got a scene and you've just got an ADR line right in the middle and they're walking on gravel and you just, you strip all that out, you put a nice filled track so the gravel's separate and you put the ADR in and it, you press play and you can't tell. And the ADR's there. And I think someone asked the question, yes, we do use EQ Match on Isotope. Uh, occasionally, sometimes the mixer does it, but it is a good tool. Most of the time needs a fiddle. But just when you press play and you're like, that's ADR and so is that, or one person's all ADR because of their accent or whatever, and the fill's nice underneath it, and it just works. I absolutely love it. Like, it's so satisfying. Yeah. But you have to be a certain personality, I think, to do it. No! <laughs> OCD. I, I, absolute geek. Like, it is just complete geekery. Right. Um... Okay, last question, please. Advice for people coming into the industry or something you'd wished you'd known about at the start? Callis. Oh, God, advice. <laughs> or something you wished you'd known when you set out? Oh, uh, how to use Pro Tools. I, I don't know. Uh, got, uh, more, something about talking to the mixer. That's always useful. I've no idea. No, I can't yeah. think of anything. Goodbye, Pro Tools. Uh, yeah. Rachel. Uh, I wish I had done a better degree course than I chose uh, because, or none even, because you can't. Uh, mm. I'd already started at Delaney Lee and then went off to uni because of a boy. And uh, I did media production and it wasn't uh, as hands on as, as I wished it was. I wish I'd done. Um, uh, a sound engineering kind of course, even physics, because uh, I, I would have loved to have, uh, have spent more time doing more detailed learning than I did. Um, but uh, I would say that the best way into this job would be to do a little work experience. Just come and be around around what we do for a week and you'll quickly know if you love it or hate it. And that's the only way I was to happen to be a runner at Dillian Lee. Uh, thinking I want to direct or something. I don't even know what they do here and quickly saw the secret uh, great stuff you can do <laughs> through sound. It's so creative. People have no idea. And, uh, and that was only because I happened to get a job as a runner there. If I hadn't, I would have never known about this job. Mm. Um, I think that's a big issue we've got with people coming in is that I didn't know what that sound editing existed till the middle year of my degree. Um, and I'd love for us all to get more access into schools, 15, 16 year olds, and tell them it's a job. And you really don't need to go to 
college, well, maybe college, or you don't need to get a degree. You just don't need to do that. You need to be keen and know it exists for a start. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, Simon. The only thing I'd say is uh, you, um, it's a long old call, you know, in terms of... Uh, uh, it's got a bit dark. <laughs> no, sorry. I didn't mean it like that. I mean... I was an assistant sound editor. Now I'm a sound editor. That's 20 years of my career. Do you know what I mean? It's taken 20 years to just do one rung up the ladder. So I was an assistant for, I think, seven years. I loved it. I was fine. But the first year, all I did was make smoothies. I knew how to mix in 5.1, but I, was in, I happened to get in the room with a, a really good bunch of people, and it was just good being around them. And then they let me be an assistant rather than just a trainee, uh, uh, you know, a bit more hands on. But I knew how to do all those things. I, I, I knew the Pro Tools and I knew this and I knew that. And so the moment I had an opportunity to, why don't we let Simon try that? I could do it. And, you know, and so, but, but uh, I wasn't necessarily in a hurry to do the next thing, do the next thing. I wasn't pestering people to do the next thing, do the next thing. I was just like, I'm, I'm happy I'm in the right place and just the opportunities will come slowly, slowly, slowly. And it, you know, as I say, it took seven years. It felt like a long time being an assistant, but at the time I was like, I'd, I'd happily spend my whole career as an assistant. I loved it. I loved helping people and, and making sure everything was just right for everyone. And then you know, I ended up doing dialogue editing and I, I don't envisage my job changing. I love it. It's a really strange skill set, I think, what we do, because you've got to be really good on computers. You've also got to be really good with people yeah. And you've got to understand drama. Yeah. Uh, and you've got those critical faculties as and well. So it, and, you know, it's, it, it's, quite, it's quite a unique job to be yeah. honest. And Becky. I, somebody else said this, but I think enthusiasm. I think I really pick up on when people do come in, which isn't as much as I think should be the case. And I don't know if it's a legality, but work experience. I mean, obviously with... NDAs and people being around films before they come out is tricky, but I really pick up when somebody's really enthusiastic and will bear them in mind for any trainee jobs that come up or running jobs. And I think rather than just sending your CV out, try and contact people like us or supervised sound editors or studios and just say, can I come in and even just have a coffee and a chat? Because then you become a person rather than a piece of paper. And I think that will stand you in good ground, in good stead, sorry, um, for when a, when a vacancy does come up. Um, I would warn people, this is on the dark side, yeah. that um, the hours can be very, very unpredictable, particularly when you get near temp mixes and things like that and final mixes. So be prepared uh, to cancel lots of social engagements. Um, your family and friends will have to be aware of that. And I'd say that is one of the uh, one of the downsides. But I mean, I I always quite like the unpredictability of it. I'm getting a little less so at my age. But when I was younger, I used to find it very exciting. But um, I would definitely say I would say enthusiasm. I would agree with Steve that be careful of particularly nowadays getting into huge debt with a degree if it's really going to help you. Because I know from my own experience that I wouldn't necessarily somebody wouldn't necessarily jump over somebody who didn't have a degree in terms of the ladder. I'd say it was highly unlikely because we all, we need you to have experience in our environment. Um, learn Pro at home. Yeah. To that, um, Becky, is that I had no idea how to do any of this stuff until I did my degree. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, or, and I certainly had no contacts in the business, so wouldn't have even known who to contact, how to contact it. I wouldn't have looked at a list of credits and sought supervising sound editor. I, I just have sure. drawn a blank. So I think for some people, and certainly for me, college w was, was helpful, you know, it just yeah. got me like, okay, this is how it all works. But I think what I'm trying to, trying to say is, I think sometimes people come out with a degree and think because they've spent all this money and done all this time, that they will be able to go in above a runner, say, and it's like, that isn't going to happen. You're going to still going to be a runner. So. No, that, that, that's, that's what I meant earlier was like, yes, I'd learn all that stuff, but it didn't actually do me any good. But it did teach me the stuff. It's not like I didn't yeah, learn. Yeah, yeah. So it was just useful in and of itself. But yeah, in terms of your career, nothing. 
Yeah, no but I think somebody else, as Rachel said, you know, sit in with people and watch what they do. Be around, be around the environment as much as is possible. Yeah, um, and we've had um, an offer of some people who would like to do work experience on the side panel here. So there you go. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so uh, I would say no one's ever asked me even, did you get a degree or what did you get? I got a first, by the way, if anyone's interested. What? No, no one's yeah, ever. I never knew that. Uh, let's see and it doesn't make any difference I went back to the same job that I had before I started but that's just my opinion what was your degree in I don't even know what that was media production oh media production so you just said that yeah. Yeah. what about you Steve you got any advice for people uh, no same thing um, don't worry too much about the courses just get um, get Pro Tools free get some cheap plugins, get a, the cheapest recorder you can. You don't have to spend a lot of money on gizmos and kit. You really don't. If you're into sound effects, just start recording things, record actual effects, record atmospheres, go on the train, record people talking, like start loving listening to stuff, like where you're just wandering around going, oh, this is amazing. Cause you're just listening, like break it, break your world up into how a film is. You've got the atmospheres, you've got the spot effects, you've got the sound design, you've got the crowd, the ADR, all the people talking. Like try and identify each part while you're walking around and think, God, I wish I'd recorded those two people chatting over there because it's brilliant. They've got a really strong accent and I love them. So yeah. just, just start doing it as much as you can record things edit things shoot your own foley for a film that's on the net um uh, try and record some adr try and fit some adr like just try and start doing it and if you feel you like it because it's very clear very quickly if you're cut out for it and if you love it i remember on my course um having to put a door in sync and it'll have been miles out of sync i'm sure if i looked at it now but i love the process of nudging it one way, nudging it another way, and slowly, slowly getting it right till it looked right. And what happens is, what I find is the sound disappears. It's just, it's, right. it's just the thing. The, yeah. the door's closed, but you don't hear the door and see the door. It's just this one entity. And you very quickly work out if you've got a love for that or not. So just, just get on and do that and um, bother people bother as many of us we're all a really nice bunch of people and we love people getting in touch um, you can do it via Beck too um, uh, the website uh, roughassembly.com you can send um, me a message on there the post sound section on there um, the community in the union's great you can get to talk to all of us um, we're all in the union. You, you, you get access to all of us and you can ask advice. Like people have said, is this a bad amount of money to get for this particular job? And you're like, yeah, that is, they're taking the mick. You should ask for more and they've got it. Um, so it's fundamentally where the freelancers who will employ you. And so you have to have made contact with us for us to be able to employ you. We have to see you and that you're keen um, and put you on the list. Um, yeah, so roughassembly.com, the roughassembly.com. Um, and you can join this week. Sorry, I'm getting messages uh, for £7.50 a month, which is a um, very good deal. You get all the insurance, all the contract cover. Um, just call the Beck2 comms line, um, which is on the chat thing there. Uh, okay, so to some questions. I'm so sorry, we've waffed on for two, two hours now. Uh, right. Okay, let's try and keep these very brief. So, to the top. Uh, oh, this isn't brief. What are the pet hates of dialogue editors in regard, regard to what they receive from production sound mixes on set? Let's keep it clean. We like everything. Um, bad maybe, metadata. Bad metadata. Uh, noise noise reduced microphones without a backup, without the noise reduction on. Stuff like that. Uh, I'm a new sound editor. Uh, would like if it, someone's mixed um, someone mentioned it somewhere else in the tracks don't mix tracks oh, sorry do a mixed track but don't force us to use a mixed track unless i mean if you haven't gone and, and track, don't, don't track. think we just use the mixed track because there's no we way that's going to be cleaner track. than us going in forensically none, none of us have ever ever once used a mixed track and right, I, think, exactly. I think for all of us we need to set up more communication with the floor the production recordists because more and more now. yeah 
Yeah, we, we haven't done it enough. Uh, someone's asked, how does phase line work? Um, not done that before. It's uh, uh, sound radix auto align post. It just, you highlight one thing and then you click on another thing and say, put that into phase with that. It'll flip it, um, do all manner, and then it's in phase. M much better than you could ever do manually in the olden days. Do you tidy up unwanted reverb or add it with a plugin? So we do add reverb to our tracks. Would we all agree? Yep. What what sort of reverb do you use? Multiverb. So. Multiverb. Yeah. Multiverb. I I yeah revibe just for a dead simple interior because often I'll I, I'll just leave it to the mixer but I just want one running that's fine so that it sounds right whilst we're going along. Uh, Phoenix, uh, R2, yeah. and maybe a bit of Slapper if it's a canyon build. Slap, slap is brilliant for, for delay. Yeah, Slapper. I use um, a mono auto verb to help edit as well. So I have like a sort of a fixed verb that's not a, it's not a creative verb or anything. It's mono and it's literally there to help if something falls off the end. Is, is that for bad edits, Becky? Might be. But I think when I'm working with you, Steve, I just need yeah. you know, a quick fix. Oh, God, <laughs> Stick a cathedral verb on it, that'll tidy it. You can also do a tight reverb, a uh, 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 close wall reverb on uh, ADR to help sell it, or clip mic sometimes to give it a tiny bit of space. Just well, you, usually that sort of thing's done um, in the premix. That's what the premix does. The mixer will EQ anything more, or denoise a bit more, or add reverbs, that sort of thing. Um, what we do sometimes. I mean, it's, the lines are blurring more and more between the mixing mm -hmm. and the dialogue editing. And I'll certainly, we, we provide so many bounces to picture, the picture department just to keep them going, get, get a nice scene to them, that I'll certainly add a bit of reverb to that as I go. But I'm, I'm not precious about it. If the mixer, dialogue mixer then says, oh, do you mind if we play it, do something else? I'm like, yeah, throw mine away. I don't care. Do whatever you want, man. Uh, question for you, Simon. Defaulter in RMS or peak? Uh, I think peak is what I use. I set it to uh, like minus eight or something. But but again, you just play with the settings how you like. But I think. And, I um, do you do it on the boom or the radios as I well? I do it on every single track. I just set it going overnight. It takes ages, and it just goes through, and just every single track will end up at. With click, it has, hasn't actually rendered anything, but the click gain line goes so that were you to measure it at, at, at a peak, it would be whatever you set it to, minus eight, whatever. And if there's a, a compressor or something or uh, running on the track on the uh, bus or whatever, wouldn't that do a similar thing to that? As in, you know, when Chris puts his to just hold it within... Uh, no, but could this, this is more about before you've even started editing, just so you can, so when you're looking at the tracks, you, you might have a track that's the best track there, but at minus 50, it looks like, you know, just a line compared to whatever, because often the recordist will have recorded, um, yes, he's got good separation, but one's peaking at minus 50 and one's peaking at minus 10. So they look very much like the healthy one is the minus 10, but actually, once you put the clip going out, you're like, oh, actually, there's a lot of good good material on that one. Just visually, obviously, you should be using your ears anyway, but it at least means you're in the same ballpark, and when you're listening to each leg, you're not going, oh, that one's super quiet, that one's super loud, oh, I'll turn this one up, turn this one down. It just, they're all about right. All just, right. Um, okay, so do you have to constantly invest in new plugins uh, for mixers? Do yes. We, yes. We don't have to, but... It, it, I, I've got too many reverbs uh, that I don't use, and I've mm. up with it, and too many EQs that I don't. Lots of EQs and DSs as well. Oh got a range of them, yeah. Yeah, as, as Rachel mentioned, when we've done a recut, um, after it's been through a temp mix, if it's been through a mixing desk with a mixer, re record mixer, we have to then kind of double check the um, automation over all the edits we've made. So it could be a reverb just cuts off or just wangs into some different um, reverb setting or um, yeah, just anything like that. So we tend to buy the same plugins. Um, that I buy them all. There's some I'll just be like, okay, I'm not going to pay for that. I don't want to. Yeah. Um, I'll just inactivate it and just be aware that say, I'm not going to hear that reverb or it won't be as denoised because I don't have the cedar, for example. And, you know, so I'll just go, okay, well, I'll just be aware that it's slightly less noisy than this in reality. Uh, 
Um, from Daniel Cabrera. Hi, Daniel. Um, have you all tried seeded DNS within RX standalone in a selective frequency? I, I don't. RX. Hmm. Seed is not. I, I don't know that it's within RX unless there's something I don't. Well, you know what it is. There's a there's a module within RX, the the, the dialogue denoise module. Uh, there, it's basically, I'm guessing, modelled on the cedar, and yeah, sounds sounds very good. It's very, it's very good. Yeah. Yeah. It is very good. Yeah, I do like the cedar as well. Cedar is very good. I like cedar. Yeah, it's good for that constant noise. If you've got a wind in trees, it's that's shitting, it's not not as happy. Um, but yeah, distant motorway, cedar lovely. Yeah, and rain. It's quite good at rain. Constant rain. Yeah. Yeah. It's that constant white noise stuff. It's mm. amazing. And you can uh, set it to just get rid of the hiss if you just set it on the top end. Yeah, the top yeah pick the frequency. Uh, yeah. How does hearing fatigue affect the job and how do you work around it? Earplugs. In the, in the mix? In the mix, earplugs, yeah, from action well, films. Yeah. But in the mix in big action movies and stuff, but um, I don't get it in my cutting room, do you guys? No, no not at all. No, I'm not really a to, to be honest. Even though we sit within a couple of feet of some fairly beefy speakers. Uh, okay. Uh, someone asked about Jamaica in just going back to the mumbling thing. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I know the guys who mixed it. Uh, I know the, the people who edited the sound. Um, that mumbling was very much a stylistic directorial choice. That was a character that was him doing it. That was the director being happy with that. So at all the points from pre-production through the shoot, through the edit, they were happy with that. The actor was happy and the director was happy. There was obviously nothing technical about how it went out from the BBC. It was a stylistic thing. And it just happened to blow up where every, no one could understand it. He's a fantastic actor. Um, yeah. No one could understand it. But it's the, the only thing I'd say about that is it is a team sport making a movie and you've got a mumbling guy to think, was the mic necessarily in the best possible place to pick up his mumbling here? You know, a microphone here compared to here? You know, did, did they, those people negotiate exactly the best way on the ADR stage? I remember I admitted getting one line of ADR out of 20 earlier this week. So I'm not saying they did. What I mean is there's, there's, it's not, it's never one thing. It's 20 different things contribute to how Jamaica in sounded and, 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 and any one of them getting a bit better would have produced a bit better result. Do you know what I mean? But it's, it's, it's certainly mumbling actors. It's certainly a director who's so familiar with his script that he just, he just knows exactly what's being said at all times because he wrote the bloody script. So he can't psychologically unpick that. There's, there's, it's, it's, it's just such a complicated story behind why films, films and TV shows can sound bad. And I don't, I don't think it's ever down to one thing. I got to the point now where I, sometimes for clarity, I don't write the, the line on the page. Yeah. So you have to listen to it to figure it out. You can't yeah. read it on the page. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've heard that actors eating chocolate before recording ADR is a nightmare. <laughs> Any more tips like that? Uh, yeah, don't drink milk. Uh, I've got one. Eat a banana. If you're going to have a rumbly tummy while you're recording, which you can Ooh, do, yeah. uh, a banana stops that pretty well. Nice. And if uh, an actor, beware, if an actor is in theatre when you're doing ADR, be very wary because they'll be projecting so much on the stage that they generally come in and they're two tones lower. Their voices are kind of hoarse. Yeah. So if somebody says connect with New York because the actors on Broadway I flag up that that's probably they're going to sound quite different than they did in the shoot. Um, so, so one thing there is you can do lemon and ginger and stuff, but it's because it's they have to project so much sometimes in some plays that it really does cause ADR. Like like if actors have colds as well, if they walk in and say they've got a cold, you're like, oh god, here we go. Colds are a nightmare. There's literally nothing you can do. And no. actors assume you can EQ it out and you're like... You, it's like that, yeah, talking like that. You just so can't EQ that out. It's, it's just magic, um, which is technical. Uh, so this is from David Monteith, who's a lovely crowd artist. Um, 
from the actor point of view, sometimes it's handy not to hear your own line uh, when you're re-recording it. It can lead you back into the same problem if it's performance related. So something like if their accent is wrong on the original performance, but they need where they are, so they've got to listen to it. How do you get around that where you're going, yeah, you've got to do it like that, that projection and that speed and rhythm, but now change the accent? I would... I, I, we listen to it a few times, maybe do a few takes with it, and then go, okay, we've got the rhythm now, guys. Let's, uh, uh, as the guy said, you, you, from then on, try and do it without. And then you, you should be aware if you're straying a little too far, maybe you're listening to the rhythm in your headphones, but you know, let the actor get away from it. Um, does anyone work in the Avid Cloud? Now we, most of us work remotely. I never have. No. Uh, no, tend not to. Uh, I can't do the next clip. Uh, Rachel, how did you, what did you use to reduce the ambience noise on your 1917 clips? And how did you get rid of the static, someone else asked? Yeah, the, the main noise problem on that was uh, crew feet, because uh, unlike a lot of films where you might have the guys walking like they do, but then you might also do a wide shot, then you might have the camera at this end as they walk towards, so you've got other takes you can use with that. It's just every single time they did it, and they did each take a lot, but every single time the crew is right with them. So you've got camera, uh, the assistant, the focus puller, uh, you might have um, the boom up down there as well. A lot of big muddy feet in the trenches with them. So that was my main uh, problem for denoising. And for that, uh, I'm afraid I use spectral on RX uh, uh, to actually see the muddy feet. I had to work out which ones were theirs and you could do that because they had the low end bumps on their clip mics so you could work out where which feet were theirs so i tried to keep a little of theirs in because that's that's real and it would have damaged the dialogue to get everything out so i just concentrated on getting the crew feet out around it and just drawing it out and pasting other bits over each thing and like i was saying because they didn't really recut in the normal way i, I had a lot of time to get in there and do that and sort of rescue it as far as ambience they had the odd um a modern plane go over and things like that but you can actually see the plane the doppler sound of the plane going over in spectral you can draw it out it just it's a case of spending a lot of time doing it but you can you can do it and while we're with you rachel um did you use the ambisonics recordings uh from 1917 someone saying stuart wilson said he recorded ambisonics yeah the what the ms must be yeah 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 um yes we did yeah they um uh, it was difficult because what uh, before they started filming, we thought oh, it'd be great to have a nice um, uh, uh, MIDI stereo, I believe it is, MIDI stereo recordings uh, of them as they go through the trenches to pick up the whole world around them as they're walking through in stereo. It'd be really nice. And it was until we realised how many crew feet are all over all of that. So mm. we used it in some key places. Uh, one I can think of is the trio scene from the moment after that last clip I played, from the moment he turns around the corner and goes up towards where everybody's laying uh, injured. All, um, half of that is our crowd, but half of it is those extras actually doing the whole thing. So Ooh. that was all on lovely MS recordings and that really uh, places the viewer right inside, whereas the normal mono boom, it, it's just not as uh, engrossing. So that was useful. Descriptive. Uh, Callis, um, how many ADR cues would you expect to get through in an hour or a day? Or does it vary wildly between productions or actors? It varies wildly, but if some, you, on, on the sheets you might come, you might go say four, four minutes a cue. If someone's good, it's going to be a lot faster than that. For crowd, uh, um, maybe... Months. Six and half a day. How many? Sixty and half a day. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. I mean, um, sometimes um, breaths can take a lot longer than you think because because sometimes mm -hmm. it just says one breath cue, but actually that's two minutes and it's quite detailed and it can take a long, take quite a long time. 
Um, okay, we've got to we've got to wrap up at ten. We've been two and a quarter hours. Um, so let's just quickly whiz through. Uh, oh, recording ADR during lockdown. Uh, yeah, I've been using Clean Feed for Crowd. Um, uh, the studio has been sharing the picture on Zoom to all the crowd artists at their own homes. We've all got their own mics, preamps, um, and it's worked really well. Uh, send us an email if you need more details on that. Um, let me see the uh, while, while track dialogue on set, I think I'm fairly safe to say we never use it because they always get the words wrong and they don't give the right energy. I don't know about that. I, I, it often doesn't work, but not always. It. It's never. sometimes it's useful. Never. If it's if say it's for a letter or a voice or voiceover and somebody's in the in the right oh, zone. Yes, but if it's a scene with a conversation between oh, two. Yeah. Awesome. As far as extra recordings on set goes, a really key thing if you're going to do a car engine or anything for the effects boys is do it in, at least in stereo because they won't use it if it's mono. Uh, it's really useful to get sometimes, but if it's mono, it's not as much use. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, David Monteith, yes, we send the entire Pro Tools sessions to um, the mix stage. Uh, if I've got time, I'll show you a session. I've got one prepared for that. Um, do you ever use playlists? Never. Never. No, me either. Yeah, good. How many mics are used for ADR? Two mics. Uh, we covered some of this in one of the... Um, in, 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 in remote now, I'm getting sessions where we've got three or sometimes four because because no one's going into the booth with the actors, no one's moving, moving the mic. So now I'm getting sessions with three, maybe four mics. Okay. Very good. Uh, Mr. Diggins, good evening, sir. I bet you've gone by now. Um, uh, when you phase invert to check for changes, is it something you then check visually or do you listen? No, me. no. It, I mean, it should literally cat. I mean, if they've made no changes and it's just moved, it should cancel out to zero. So you'll 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 see that you'll see a little blob of audio, and um, you know it doesn't always work. But if you if it does cancel to zero, you can be sure nothing's changed. Okay. How does your pay work with the downtimes between temp mixes? We're still on the job. We're, we're still tweaking away. It's just it it's not as um, full on. Sometimes you get put on hiatus though. Yeah, it does happen. That, between every every temp mix, which is a week off, which is uh, yeah, rubbish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boot of the hiatus. Um, do you use uh, wild track water much if you if you get it and it's good? Yeah, I'm Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Picked up from someone else. Uh, someone talked about stripping out the atmos between the dialogue. Uh, that is, that does sometimes happen, and you can hand over everything to the effects department. It could be moves or shash or feet or whatever, but we tend to just keep it all as PFX. Um, Effects editors aren't as fastidious as us about keeping the stuff. So whenever I've given stuff, it suddenly goes missing. And you're like, where's that effect I gave you? Oh, I replaced it. And you're like, no, you can't, you know. Yeah, you need it to make it work. You yeah. have the stuff. You're, so I just like to keep hold of it these days. How do you make fill if there's no handles available? Do you use RX Match? Love it. It's good. It is good. I know I've got, a, I've got a friend working on another one um, in Italy, which I think is going to be an excellent version of that. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Do we have any involvement with the music editor? Not if we can help it. Yeah. <laughs> really? No. Oh, no I, I have today um, some songs uh, were lip synced on set and they just needed a little an eye for for real that sync sync eye so I kind of date, did a version of the song so I mean it's not my job but I said I'd do it and it was fun to do and also you hand stuff over to them that was from set that might be classified as music like that's true yeah. A, yeah a guy miming on a violin and the guy playing the violin is just off camera but he didn't mime it very well so you give it to music so that they can fit something to his hands a bit better and stuff like that but rarely really 
Uh, and Joe Jackson. Hello, Joe. Good evening. What's everyone's favourite film or TV show they've worked on and why? Uh, You've just mu muted, Sai. I'm going to name two. One is Captain Phillips. It was so bloody difficult, wasn't it, Rachel? We yeah. worked on it together. You had it a was tough time. So hard that film, but I loved it. I literally went to the cast and crew screening, and I was like on the edge of my seat, and I'd I seen it about four thousand times. Yeah, I, I, I loved it. It was really hard. I also did uh, Coriolanus, which was a Shakespeare film, and working with that dialogue was super fun. Rachel. I've got to say 1917 for obvious reasons. Of course. I'm all right out of that one. And um, I'd say The Martian, because uh, we got to go to NASA and JPL and do crowd recordings with real um, uh, control room NASA guys who were that, awesome. And that's still, so much fun. Still chat and I love them. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's great. Callis. Oh, oh, I don't know. Don't, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> I have um, a, a long time ago, 1974. Red Riding. That was really, that was really good. That was great. Yeah. So I, I love Utopia as well. The dark humor in that. Um, the Crown obviously was great. I don't know, lots of stuff really. The, the, what, usually what I'm working on now. Yeah, that's true. I'm loving, actually. Yeah. Becky. Um, I would say Two Popes, which I did a couple of years ago, 18 months Brilliant. ago. Brilliant. Um, because I, I loved the script as soon as I got the script. I loved the film as soon as I saw it. And the team I was working with, the producer, director, editor, there was no egos. It was just a lovely, lovely team. And I got to go to Argentina. So that was Nice. Great. Yeah. Yes. And then I would say Atonement is also up there because it was, it was probably one of my first really big films that got a lot of attention. And it was a great crew. And I got to travel to LA quite a lot with that one as well. So... Yeah, those two. I, I think it it always like you'll never work on a really good film for for people who aren't so nice and then love that film. Mm. Like the team and the people behind you all feed into how much you love that film. Some some brilliant films you just can't watch again because of you know, <laughs> yeah, your um, memories are so bad. Yeah, various personalities or whatever. Um, uh, but like Simon, I just love the the ones where you weren't for lovely people, the films are great and it's really hard, but satisfying, like brutally hard. Mm. Like sort of just so much logistics and organizing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just the really tough ones to do. Um, okay. A uh, quick roundup. Sorry. We haven't got through all of the questions. There are a few left, but we've got to, we've got to call it. Uh, thank you to everyone. It's been such good fun seeing you all and talking to you all. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks so much for your time and um, take care and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye, yeah, everybody. Well done, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.